Just stick in there. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Selamat pagi dan selamat datang Yang saya hormati para pembicara dan moderator Yang telah hadir di RSCM Kirana Kepala Departemen dan seluruh staf Departemen Mata FKUI RSCM Seluruh dokter spesialis mata dan residen di Indonesia Also we would like to welcome our honorable speakers From National University Hospital Singapore Professor Clement Tan and Professor Paul Chu Also, we have here some attendees from uh, Japan, from Myanmar, and Singapore. Selamat bergabung pada seri pertama dari rangkaian RSCM Kirana NUH Collaborative Webinar Series. Sesi ilmiah hari ini akan dibagi menjadi dua. Sesi pertama terdiri dari materi dengan topik neurooftalmologi dan sesi kedua mencakup materi dengan topik glaukoma. Untuk membuka kegiatan pada hari ini, saya persilahkan Kepala Departemen Mata FKW RSCM, Dr. Dr. Andi Arus Victor, Spesialis Mata Konsultan, untuk memberikan kata sambutan. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Para, para hadirin, acara webinar pada hari ini. Selamat datang untuk menghadiri acara ini. Good morning, Professor Clementan and Professor Paul Chu. Pertama-tama, saya panjatkan puji syukur kehadirat Allah Subhanahu SWT bahwa pada hari ini kita dapat bersama-sama mengikuti acara kolaboratif webinar ini. Kegiatan ini adalah dalam rangka acara Continuing Ophthalmology Education yang rutin biasa dilakukan oleh Departemen Mata FKU RSCM yang memang selalu kita adakan. Namun pada kali ini topik yang dibuat 
seperti kita ketahui bersama sangat menarik dan sudah dipilih. Beberapa sesi, empat sesi yang akan datang yang akan kita ikuti sama-sama. On behalf of our department, I would like to thanks to Professor Clementine and Professor Pauchu for your support in this collaborative webinar series. We do hope in the future we can keep and increase our collaboration and maybe we can make another kind of program in the future. Para hadirin sekalian yang saya hormati, saya tidak terlalu berpanjang-panjang karena waktu yang sudah ditunggu-tunggu oleh hadirin sekalian. Oleh karena itu, saya ucapkan sekali lagi semoga acara yang telah disusun oleh panitia ini dapat bermanfaat pada hadirin sekalian. Dan kepada panitia tentunya saya mengucapkan banyak terima kasih atas kerja kerasnya mengatur acara ini sehingga acara ini dapat berlangsung dan insya Allah pada sesi-sesi berikutnya juga dapat berlangsung dengan baik. Akhir kata, wabilai taufik walidaya, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, om swastiastu, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua, selamat pagi, selamat mendengarkan. as the head of department of ophthalmology national university hospital to deliver a speech and open this webinar scientific meeting today please bro good morning everyone selamat pagi uh, it's a, a great uh, honor and pleasure to collaborate with uh, rcm kirana on this webinar series um it is uh, amazing that a lot of this is built on friendship. Um, starting, I think, a lot with the friendship between Professor Paul Chu, who was a uh, previous head of department before me, uh, and Dr. Ika Sumantri. And I asked Prof. Chu how long he's known Dr. Ika, and he said 20 years. That's a long time, and it's wonderful that this friendship had been built up over this time, enabling us to uh, develop good relationship. Myself, I've known uh, Dr. Muhammad Siddiq for, well, nearly 15 years, we, we, we met at a conference in, for neuroophthalmology in, uh, I think, in Geneva. And uh, from then, the friendship has grown. And latterly, with uh, Cynthia, uh, with uh, all the other neuro, for, for myself, with all the other neuroophthalmologists uh, in Indonesia. Uh, and I know some of you are listening in. And so, a uh, very good morning. And it's great to kind of meet you all in this way. Uh, we miss a lot the ability to get together in person and to share knowledge and to share our experiences. I think what we look forward to uh, in this webinar and in the future is an opportunity to keep the friendships alive, to make new friends and to forge ahead together as, as neighbors, uh, as uh, fellow doctors and ophthalmologists there is a lot that we can learn from one another. And it's always wonderful to watch each other um, grow, to watch each other get better at the things that we do, uh, to help each other along the way. And I, th I hope that this will be the spirit in which we continue to have uh, collaborations one with another, that we will move forward together as neighbors and as friends. And that's the most important thing for the peoples of uh, this region, that all of us will be united and will work together. It's a pity that because of the, the COVID-19 situation, we cannot have nice meetings together. I, I really do miss traveling to Indonesia for conferences. It's a beautiful country. Um, 
And it's something to look forward to for the future. And so my thanks to uh, Dr. Andy Victor, to the organizing committee. You've done a wonderful job in putting this whole program together. It is indeed our pleasure to participate, to collaborate. And we hope there'll be many more in the future. So with that, I wish all of you a really enjoyable time of listening to the speakers uh, and of learning one with another. God bless you all. for your enlightening speech. Uh, selanjutnya akan saya persilahkan uh, moderator Dr. Ardiela Yunard, spesialis mata, untuk memandu sesi ilmiah pada hari ini. Glaucoma patients face a gap in their care between non-compliance with drugs and an invasive surgery. Iridex bridges this gap with a Micropulse P3 device, an innovation in transclerocyclophotocoagulation, powered by the Cyclo G6 glaucoma laser system. With standard laser technology, a continuous beam is delivered to the tissue, leading to heat buildup that may cause tissue damage. Micropulse technology chops that laser beam into trains of repetitive on and off pulses. A controlled perspective study performed at the National University Hospital Singapore resulted in a 33% reduction in IOP at 18 months and medications were reduced from a mean of 2.1 to 1.3. The laser console is efficient and straightforward for the physician and the patient. Micropulse P3 can be performed in the office or in the OR and is highly efficient. Setup is easy. and participants, thank you for joining with us. My name is Ardiela. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. So the first part is neuro-ophthalmologization. We will Dr. Muhammad Siddiq, Dr. Cynthia, and Professor Clementine. After three presentations, we will have discussion. So feel free to type your questions at the chat box. We will accommodate to answer your questions. So now, allow me to start the first session by welcoming Dr. Muhammad Siddiq. Dr. Muhammad Siddiq, Specialist Mata Consultant, is our Neuro-Ophthalmology Consultant in the Department of uh, Ophthalmology, Cipto Mangunkesumo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. He is the President of Persatuan Dr. Mata Indonesia, Perdami. He has fellowship on Electrophysiology Universitas, uh, University of Vienna, Austria, and he is the board member of Asian Neuro-Ophthalmology. So please, Dr. Siddiq, you may start uh, your presentation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi. Uh, pertama, terima kasih untuk panitia yang telah mengundang saya untuk bicara pada kesempatan yang sangat baik ini. Uh, especially good morning to Dr. Professor Clementa, my best friend from Singapore, Professor Pauci, and all attendees from abroad. Uh, but uh, please forgive me because I want to have my presentation in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, saya akan berbicara mengenai visual pathway problems. Uh, Pada kesempatan pagi ini saya akan membagi mandiri menjadi tiga bagian. Yang pertama adalah mengenai visual pathway sendiri, apa, apa itu visual pathway, anatomi dan fisiologi. Kemudian saya akan sampaikan beberapa contoh kasus yang berhubungan dengan kelainan pada visual pathway. Kemudian terakhir ada kesimpulan. Kalau kita bicara visual pathway, barangkali 
saya tidak uh, tahu dimulai dari mana karena mungkin kalau orang retina bicara visual fallopian dimulai dari lapisan fotoreseptor tapi kami neuroftalmologis bicara mulai dari sel ga, uh, ganglion yang berada di lapisan uh, gang retina nerf, uh, rapisan retina uh, dimulai dari sel ganglion kemudian berlanjut ke akson yang kemudian berkumpul menjadi uh, apa namanya nervus optikus kalau kita lihat ini sekilas gambaran bahwa visual pathway dimulai dari gas akson kemudian masuk ke nervus optikus berjalan bersilangan di kiasma bagian lateral tidak bersilang bagian medial bersilang kemudian masuk bersinap pertama adalah di corpus geniculatum lateral ada beberapa hal yang perlu disampaikan pada visual pathway ini bahwa visual pathway di mural dimulai dari sel ganglion kemudian e, berjalan e, sel ganglion mengeluarkan akson berjalan e, di dalam lapisan nerve fiber layer di retina e, kemudian masuk ke dalam optic nerve head di situ ada lapisan lamina cribrosa yang terdiri dari septa septa begitu keluar dari lapisan, lapisan lamina cribrosa lamina cribrosa lapisan e, akson atau e, Lapisan nerve fiber layer yang tadinya tidak bermielin, kemudian mulai diselubungi oleh selubung mielin, kemudian berlanjut masuk e, ke dalam kanalis optikus dan berlanjut ke intrakranial. E, di sini adalah e, contoh gambar dari e, lapisan lamina cribrosa yang terdiri dari septa-septa, di mana septa ini dimasuki oleh berbagai bandel dari nervus e, optikus. Ada kurang lebih 1,2 juta serbut akson yang masuk melalui septa ini kemudian berlanjut menjadi nervus optikus. Kalau kita bicara uh, nervus optikus anak, maka ada beberapa hal yang perlu kita perhatikan. Yang pertama adalah uh, selubung mielin, mielin. Bahwa nervus optikus begitu uh, lap, atau lapisan uh, akson begitu keluar dari nervus uh, lapisan kerebrosa mulai diselubung oleh, oleh selubung mielin. Selubung, selubung mielin ini sendiri sebetulnya mempunyai uh, beberapa hal yang uh, sangat krusial. Yang pertama adalah melindungi lapisan akson sendiri dari uh, gangguan uh, dari luar. Jadi dia uh, mengisolasi lapisan uh, serabut akson. Yang kedua adalah berguna dalam hal mempercepat konduksi saraf uh, melalui node of Renvir. Uh, kita lihat bahwa pada beberapa keadaan di mana terjadi demielinasi, terjadi gangguan konduksi saraf dan terjadilah gangguan uh, fungsi saraf penglihatan. Jadi ada dua hal penting. Yang pertama adalah melindungi uh, akson sendiri. Yang kedua adalah mempercepat propagasi atau hantaran konduksi dari akson. Pada saat terjadi kerusakan mielin, maka bisa juga terjadi kerusakan uh, sel akson sendiri. Kemudian uh, yang berikut adalah yang juga tidak tidak kalah penting adalah uh, vas vaskularisasi dari nervus optikus. Nefus optikus sendiri mendapat vaskularisasi dari cabang arteriofthalmica yang kemudian bercabang men mensarafi papil nefus optikus melalui arteri ciliaris posterior brofis kemudian kemudian melalui lapisan uh, memberi juga pedarahan pada bagian belakang dari nefus optikus melalui uh, arteri arteri subdural. Ini adalah uh, gambar dari uh, contoh atau gambar skematis dari uh, vaskularisasi nefus optikus. Yang perlu diperhatikan adalah daerah papil, papil nefus optikus karena disinilah sering terjadi kelainan. Kita ketahui bahwa adanya iskemik pada papil nefus optikus akan menyebabkan kelainan iskemik optik neuropati. Uh, yang barangkali ada dua hal yang juga saya ingin sampaikan bahwa pada akson sesungguhnya terjadi satu transport mulai dari badan sel ke distal, kemudian dari distal ke badan sel melalui yang disebut dengan akson transport. Akson transport ini membawa uh, energi protein ke daerah distal, kemudian membawa produk degradasi dari distal ke soma atau ke badan sel. Yang kedua adalah bahwa untuk aktivitas akson diri membutuhkan energi yang disuplai uh, oleh mitokondria melalui ATP. Jadi beberapa hal ini yang perlu diperhatikan karena Kelainan pada beberapa hal ini akan menyebabkan kemudian terjadinya kelainan pada nefus optikus. Beberapa penyebab yang sering menjadi penyebab adalah pertama inflamasi, imunologi atau diopatik, kemudian iskemik, intoksikasi, hereditar, dan atau konversi atau trauma. Ini adalah hal-hal yang bisa menyebabkan kelainan pada nervus optikus. Saya berikan contoh beberapa kasus. Yang pertama adalah kasus inflamasi. Di sini ada 
contoh kasus uh, tipikal optik neritis uh, seorang gadis 11 tahun uh, mengalami gangguan penglihatan pada mata kiri yang didahului oleh demam satu minggu sebelumnya. Uh, Khusus masih 6 per 6, akan, tapi si anak ini sudah menderita, uh, sudah mengalami gangguan penglihatan. Dan kita lihat bahwa uh, papil nervus opticus pada mata kiri mengalami udema. Dan ini adalah satu kasus papilitis atau optik neuritis pada mata kiri. Setelah diberikan steroid, pasien kemudian uh, membaik. Ini adalah contoh kasus tipikal. Berikut adalah uh, kasus atipikal optik neuritis. Seorang laki-laki mengalami gangguan eh, penglihatan pada mata kiri, tiapkan eh, RAPD. Eh, saya ingin menyampaikan bahwa eh, pada kasus neris optika yang atipikal harus kita eksplorasi lebih lanjut. Eh, yang sering terjadi adalah apabila seorang laki-laki menderita optik neuritis, kita perhatikan kemungkinan ke penyakit lain. Contoh adalah HIV, kemudian sifilis, dan lain-lain. Jadi setiap kasus nervus optika atipikal harus eksplorasi lebih jauh, seperti yang saya sebutkan tadi. Ini ada, kemudian ternyata memang pada pasien ini didapatkan adanya kemungkinan sifilis. pada. Jadi ini adalah satu bentuk contoh dari neurosifilis. Kemudian hereditary adalah ini adalah satu kasus pasien 23 tahun laki-laki yang tipikal dengan Lon, kita lihat progresivitas uh, penurunan fungsi penglihatan dari bulan Mei hingga Juli 2019 dari setengah meter finger counting dan 9 menjadi hand movement dan satu mm. Ini uh, tipikal penyakit uh, yang disebabkan oleh adanya mutasi pada mitokondrial DNA atau hereditary optic neuropathy. Ini adalah contoh uh, gambaran pundus kemudian gambaran uh, ini contoh lain dari Uh, optik neuropati. Nah, yang ingin saya sampaikan adalah bahwa pada seorang, pada setiap pasien laki-laki bilateral dengan fisus turun, biasanya sekuensial, satu mata dioli kemudian mata berikutnya, tolong dipikirkan kemungkinan adanya mitokondrial optik neuropati atau lebih kita kenal sebagai LON. Pasien berikut adalah pasien kompresi, yang pertama adalah uh, pasien dengan uh, pituitary adenoma atau tumor hipofisis dengan bitemporal defect. Ini sangat spesifik ya. Uh, yang ingin saya sampaikan adalah bahwa jangan lupa untuk memeriksa kampus pada setiap pasien dengan gangguan penglihatan. Karena seringkali pasien tidak bisa menggambarkan apa yang dirasakannya. Ini adalah contoh papil udem dengan akibat peningkatan tekanan intrakranial karena meningioma. Kemudian berikutnya adalah papil udem tanpa adanya tumor intrakranial dan kita kenal sebagai benign intracranial hypertension. Kemudian berikutnya adalah kasus intoksikasi. Saya ingin mengingatkan bahwa pasien yang sering datang ke poliklinik mata, yaitu pasien seorang biasanya laki-laki, usia muda, dengan keluhan visus turun mendadak, dan pasien umumnya tidak pernah bicara mengatakan bahwa dia sudah minum. Biasanya pasien mengeluh sakit perut, muntah-muntah, menguang sesak nafas, besoknya kemudian terjadi gangguan penglihatan. Tolong jangan lupa tanyakan adakah riwayat minum alkohol, karena seringkali pasien tidak mau mengakui. Dan uh, perlu diketahui bahwa pasien pasien dengan intoxikasi metanol umumnya uh, irreversible. Ya. Apa, kecuali apabila pasien datang pada fase akut, mungkin bisa dilakukan hemodialisis, akan tapi kerusakan yang sudah terjadi akibat uh, formaldehid biasanya irreversible. Ini kasus contoh kasus lain uh, atrofi papil akibat intoxikasi metanol. Kemudian yang berikut adalah iskemik. Uh, tadi saya saya sudah bicara mengenai vaskularisasi uh, optic, optic nerve uh, pada gangguan papil atau panduan gangguan vaskularisasi uh, optic nerve biasanya disebabkan adanya sumbatan pada uh, arteri ciliaris posterior brofis. Pasien biasanya sangat spesifik mengeluhkan pandangan buram mendadak pada pagi hari dan buramnya biasanya hanya sebagian umumnya di bagian bawah. Tolong tanyakan apakah ada riwayat penyakit sistemik, apakah diabetes mellitus, apakah hipertensi atau hiperkolesterolemia atau dislipidemia dan riwayat merokok. Hal-hal yang saya sebutkan tadi merupakan faktor risiko untuk terjadinya NAION. 
uh, apabila sudah terjadi aneoin, umumnya irreversible. irreversible. Dan uh, perlu diketahui bahwa faktor risiko harus dicari karena bukan tidak mungkin bisa terjadi uh, aneoin berikut pada mata sebelahnya. Ini adalah salah satu contoh uh, saya sebutkan. Pasien mengalami aneoin pada mata kanan, satu tahun kemudian mata kirinya mengalami hal yang sama karena uh, tidak terkontrolnya faktor-faktor sistemik pada pasien. Biasanya reversible. Akan tapi uh, dengan kami mencoba memberikan dengan beberapa uh, rezimen terapi yang pernah dilakukan, beberapa kasus meskipun tidak ada rezimen yang baku untuk NON, uh, pasien alhamdulillah bisa membaik kembali. Uh, iskemik tidak hanya bisa terjadi pada nefes optikus, akan tapi bisa juga terjadi di sentral. Ini adalah salah satu uh, contoh ya. Uh, adanya iskemik di daerah occipital lobe gambarannya khas yaitu adanya hemianopsia homonim apakah dextra atau sinistra tergantung bagian mana yang mengalami iskemik uh, pada kali sebagai kesimpulan dari uraian singkat saya pada pagi hari ini uh, hendaklah dilakukan amnesis yang berhati-hati dan terarah karena dengan amnesis yang terarah dan lengkap dikatakan bahwa separuh penyakit neurofisiologi bisa diprediksi atau bisa didiagnosis. Kemudian yang juga tidak penting adalah mengetahui epidemiologi penyakit tertentu. Misalnya apabila seorang wanita dat muda datang dengan keluhan visus turun mendadak satu mata, boleh diberikan bahwa ini adalah optik neuritis. Tapi jangan pikirkan seorang laki-laki dengan gangguan visus mendadak satu mata karena Biasanya kadang mungkin saja optik neurotis, tapi biasanya penyakit lain, penyakit retina yang seringkali dikirimkan dengan diagnosis optik neurotis ternyata adalah sentral serus retinopati. Kemudian tadi saya katakan apabila seorang laki-laki datang dengan dua mata visus turun mendadak, tolong perhatikan apakah ada riwayat optik neurotis. Kemudian yang lain lagi apabila kita dapatkan optik neuritis atipikal, silakan eksplorasi lebih jauh kemungkinan penyakit lain. Karena sekarang ternyata sifilis sudah mulai banyak ditemukan, mungkin karena adanya HIV dan lain-lain. Kan tapi uh, hal baiknya adalah bahwa neurosifilis dikatakan mempunyai prognosis baik karena pengobatannya murah dan mudah didapat. Lakukanlah semua pemeriksaan neurofisiologi yang bisa dilakukan di setiap klinik teman-teman semua. Karena eh, kadang-kadang pemeriksaan neurofisiologi sederhana misalnya tes konfrontasi eh, untuk melihat lapang pandang bisa mendapatkan hal-hal yang eh, penting. Misalnya di temporal defect eh, pada pituitary adenoma dan sangat menolong pasien karena makin cepat didapat, makin cepat, makin bagian prognosisnya. Tolong diingat bahwa melakukan pemeriksaan tambahan hanya dilakukan berdasarkan indikasi. Jangan semua pasien di MRI, jangan di semua pasien di scan misalnya. Karena hal ini selain membuat waktu juga memboroskan biaya. Demikian markal yang ingin saya sampaikan, mudah-mudahan apa yang saya sampaikan bisa ditangkap. Orang singkat ini bisa bermanfaat untuk teman-teman semua yang bekerja di seluruh pelosok tanah air Indonesia. Bila Taufik wal Hidayah, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Sidik, for your presentation. We will proceed to our next speaker, Dr. Cynthia. Dr. Cynthia Dusanti, spesialis mata konsultan MPET uh, kedokteran. Uh, she is the neurophthalmology consultant, Department of Ophthalmology, Cipto Maun Kusumo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. She is the head of neurophthalmology division, Department of Ophthalmology, Cipto Maun Kusumo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. She is also Secretary of Ophthalmology Residency Program, Cipto Maun Kusumo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. 
She is the head of Indonesian Neuroophthalmology Society or INANOS. So please, Dr. Cynthia, you may proceed your presentation. Um, thank you, moderator. Uh, good morning to all. Good morning, Prof. Clement, Prof. Paul Chu, and to all attendees. Um, today, I would like to uh, talk about an, an isochoria um, and how to decide which one is an uh, abnormal one. Objective of this talk is, uh, first, I will talk about the pupil and the iris, the algorithm of the anisocoria, physiological anisocoria, Horner syndrome, third nerve palsy, and tonic pupil. The fourth uh, diagnosis that um, we uh, um, usually meet at our uh, clinics. Um, first of all, the pupil constrict relative to the amount of light perceived uh, by, by the eye. This one is the um, measure of uh, average of visual functions, RAPE. When the pupillary average system is normal, the pupil in right and left eye are clinically the same size as each other. And pupil size is ultimately det determined by the balance of average sympathetic and parasympathetic flow to the, uh, to the pupil musculature. Um, what happens if uh, there is an isochoria? And isochoria is in inequality in pupil size and lies caused by mechanical in the iris, abnormality uh, caused by imbalance of the efferent autonomic. If, uh, if we know that um, in the iris, there is uh, two kinds of uh, muscles. The first one is constriction of muscles, the iris sphincter. Uh, it's uh, stimulated by parasympathetic and it can cause the muscle to contract. And the second one is the sympathetic stimulations cause the radial muscle to contract. Uh, this one is the dilator muscles. And from the sympathetic pathway, if we can see here, the first order is from the hypothalamus to the ciliospinal cilio center at the cervical A2 thoracal 2 and this part. And the second order will be from the uh, base of the superior cervical ganglion to the cervical, superior cervical ganglion at the uh, cervical 3 to cervical 4. And the third order will be from the superior cervical ganglion to the dilator pupil. It will travel along with the uh, internal carotid artery through cavernous sinus and uh, will be stimulated to pseudomotor and vasomotor of the forehead, uh, the muscles, uh, molar muscles, and to the latter pupils. Uh, the parasympathetic pathway um, the, uh, in the orbit, the pupillary constrictor muscle is innervated by parasympathetic components of the cranial nerve tree. And the parasympathetic pupillary motor fibers is originated from Edinger Wells spal nuclei located in the most dorsals of uh, cranial nerve nuclear complex. If we can see here, the parasympathetic fibers travels as a part of uh, nerve tree. At, it follows the inferior divisions of the nerve tree to go to the ciliary ganglion. And it will be synapse at ciliary ganglion. After ciliary ganglion, the post ganglion fibers will travel to iris sphincter via short posterior ciliary nerves and then travel to subcara subcoroidal uh, space to iris sphincter and ciliary muscles. Uh, if light stimulation is processed in the retina, it will be conveyed to the brain via retinal ganglion cells. There's a special retinal ganglion cell send their, their output directly to the pupillary centers in the midbrain. And axons from this special retinal gang ganglion cell will travel along with the axon carrying vis visual information in this part and from the optic nerve, optic chiasms, and optic thread. Slightly uh, like the axon from the visual information, axon from the pupillary, uh, pupillary fibers also, also have uh, decusations in the chiasm. So if we have a uh, tractus lesions, we can have uh, RAPD 
presence in the contralateral eye. This one, this one is the contralateral eye, the eye with the temporal defect, not the eye with the nasal defects. And then uh, after that, pupillary axon will lift the lateral geniculatum body to synapse in midbrain pectectal nucleus. This one happened the second hemidecusations. It provides input to equally input to Edinger Westphal. So an esocoria cannot happen because of the uh, visual uh, pathway uh, defects. It only happens because of the um, motoric defects. Um, let's go to anisocoria. If there's an anisocoria, we have to um, think that there is something happen not only in the eye, but also in the orbit, brain, neck, and upper chest. This, the first one we have to think, is it a pathologic or a physiologic? If it's a pathologic, is it, um, it is problem, parasympathetic chain problem, sympathetic chain problems. And we have to decide which sides of the anisocoria is um, the defect, the larger one or the small one. If we can see here, the right eye have a bigger uh, pupil compared to the left eye. Um, in B, both pupil constrict in bright and in dim light, left pupil did not dilate. So still four millimeters. So the small pupil is the problem for the B. The second one, in dim light, both pupil dilate. In bright light, right pupil did not constrict. So if we can see here, the larger pupil is the abnormal. Uh, the first question we have to ask is, do, do, do both, uh, both pupil constrict briefly to light? If yes, the second question is, the smaller pupil is abnormal. Did they have mitosis, dilations of leg, and isochoria increase in dark? If the, uh, the answer is yes, it's probable, probable of Horner syndromes. If the answer is no, it will be probable of physiologic anisocoria. If our first question answer is no, the larger pupil is abnormal. Is there any history of trauma or intraocular surgery? If yes, likely it's a traumatic midriasis. If no, we have to see whether there is a pathosis in the site of larger pupil, diplopia or abnormal motility. If the answer of this question is yes, it's possible of partial nerve palsy. If is it no, are both of the following presence? So constrictions too near or spiralings of the pupil margin on slit lamp examinations? If yes, it's likely tonic pupil. And is it not? Uh, we have to think about pharmacological, pharmacologic uh, dilations. This is the differential diagnosis of anisocoria with pupil reactive to light. We will talk about physiologic anisocoria and Horner syndrome. In physiological anisocoria, it happens in 50 to 20% of normal people, no visual effects, always less than uh, 1.0 or uh, 0.5 millimeter in difference. We can do a test of uh, drops cocaine, 10% dilations of both pupil after 45 minutes. So in normal pupil, if we uh, put two drops of cocaine, uh, will be uh, dilations. So the pupil will be constricted normally to light and uh, also to near target. No change on isochoria gap uh, on both pupil between light and dim. We go to Horner syndrome. If we found a patient with Horner syndrome, the clinical finding will be an isochoria, rarely more than two millimeter with small pupil on the lesions. Pathosis on ipsilateral, not more than three millimeter, it, because of Muller involvement, upside down ptosis, dilations of legs of affected pupil, ipsilateral facial anhidrosis, it depends on the lesions, and apparent anophthalmus. This is the first one to uh, try to uh, check whether this is Horner syndrome or not. The transmitter substance of the neuromuscular junction of the sympathetic pathway is norepinephrine. Uh, the cocaine, 10% of cocaine, can block the normal reuptake of uh, norepinephrine, and norepinephrine will be accumulated in the synaptic, so uh, the pupil will be dilating. At the preganglion, there is no uh, norepinephrine or just a little norepinephrine, so that can be blocked by the cocaine. And the postganglionic, uh, the 
presynaptic terminal is not functional. So if you can see here, um, the normal eye will be dilated, the preganglion and the postganglion uh, Horner syndrome will be not dilated. The examinations of the Horner syndrome before cocaine in room light, after uh, five uh, minutes after turning off light and 45 minutes after cocaine in room light, there is also no uh, dilatations of the affected pupil. Uh, place the cocaine, place the cocaine uh, in the eye with the sm smallest pupil because it's very irritable and always examine the pupil in that condition because it's um, uh, changed the sympathetic pathway. Um, cocaine is not um, uh, easy to find. So uh, we can use apraclonidine. The apraclonidine is uh, alpha one, weak alpha one agonist. Uh, it will be egg in, uh, egg in presynaptic bulb to uh, decrease the neuro, uh, norepinephrine and weaken the dilations of pupil in normal. In Horner syndrome, lack of sympathetic tone, so it's super sensitivity to apraclonidine. So if we put apraclonidine, uh, the affected pupil will be delayed, the normal does not change, it can happen the reverse of anisocoria. If you can see here, after uh, using 0.5% of apraclonidine, uh, in the B, you can see the, the Horner syndrome uh, pupil become dilated, it will be uh, uh, more big than the non-affected side. So it called the reverse anisocoria, and if you can see, the ptosis is getting better. The cause of Horner syndrome in the first order, uh, of course, you have to see the anatomical lesions, the hypothalamus to spinal cord. It can be happened because of two more hemorrhages, infractions, and uh, multiple sclerosis. And the second order, you have to see the thoracic cavity and neck. Uh, the most uh, diagnosis is the pancreas tumor, metastasis, and mediastinal mass. The third order will be carotid actor reflexus, cavernous sinus, and others. Uh, we have to localize the lesions with hydroxyamphetamine. 1% of hydroxyamphetamine will be forced the release of norepinephrine from presynaptic phys physical into synaptic clefts. So it will be delayed normal pupil. The postganglionic will not dilate it. False negative we use within 7 to 10 days after acute onset. But we can use penelephrine 1% to delete postganglionic. This is from after 1% of hydro, uh, hydroxyamphetamine, the postganglionic corner still not delayed. We have clinical cue if we don't have any pharmacologic. The heterochromia clue is too congenital or very long standing. Facial or neck suggests carotid dissection. Ipsilateral six nerve palsy suggests cavernous sinus lesions or brain stem. Multiple ipsilateral ocular motor nerve paresis suggests postganglionic lesions. Hand weakness or clawing suggests cervical cord lesions. Loss of sweating on the side of Horner pupil suggests a central or preganglionic. Isolated, but isolated anhydrosis in forehead area suggested postganglionic. You can test the loss of sweating with only spoon uh, test. The sensitivity of spoon test is uh, uh, 86%. You can put the spoon uh, at the area of the face. The work that we have to do with the Horner syndrome for central or preganglionic, so cervical spine X-ray, uh, chest X-ray, uh, CT, MRI brain, detailed view on brain stem. Uh, we can uh, also doing a MRI or CT of neck. And uh, for postganglionic, the MRI brain detail is for the cavernous sinus. This is one case of male 43 year olds. Uh, the complaints of double vision, right eye, looks, uh, right eye looks smaller than left eye. If you can see here in the primary position, head as clock nose, double vision, and decreased sensibility on the right side. In the bright, we can see that the, uh, the pupil uh, anisocoria and in dim light, it also cannot be dilated. Uh, because these patients have a double vision, um, the ipsilateral uh, uh, paralysis of the ocular motor, the clock nose, and the uh, uh, decrease of sensibility, we can see that there is a cavernous sinus uh, uh, lesions. So this one is postganglionic corner syndrome due to cavernous sinus lesions uh, of the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. The differential diagnosis of ansocoria with pupil with non or poor reactive to light is pharmacologic blockage, tonic pupil, and third nerve palsy. Uh, the pharmacologic blockage is never due to a systemic absorption Larger fixed dilated pupil cannot be overcome by topical agents. 
uh, for the testing place two drop of one percent filocarpine in each lower cool de sac for 45 minutes anything less than full constrictions uh, is a positive test for pharma pharmacological uh, blockage the third nerve palsy if I mentioned before that uh, the third nerve emerged from brainstem to uh, interpendicular fossa and traveling to subarachnoid space to the cavernous sinus. Uh, it travels adjacent to and lateral to posterior communicating artery. The pupillometer uh, fibers is traveled superomedially. So superficial locations make pupillary involvement more likely because of external force compared to ischemia. The aneurysma in this junction can pose uh, the anisocoria, the third nerve palsy with pupil involvement. The red flags of the, the, this uh, third nerve palsy is sudden onset of pain, painful third nerve palsy, pupil involvement, no history of trauma, no history of vascular disease, should be suspected as cerebral artery aneurysma, and we have to do MRI, MRI angiogram of four vessels. These patients with third nerve palsy with pupillary involvement and this one, the woman 47 years old, droopy eyelids since two weeks, they have dizzy, double vision, head edge, no, di no diabetes mellitus, no hypertension, no history of smoking. There's a eye movement restriction, so no up, up case. Uh, the anisocoria is greater in the bright, if you can see here. And the argent emery, so the thrombus sinus agilitalis uh, superior. This is a summary of uh, third nerve palsy. If you have a dilated pupil, no light resection, an isocoria in bright light, weak light resection, with partial or total, you have to think this is a high risk of aneurysm. Workup is urgent MRI brand with contrast MRI and CTA. The tonic pupil, damage to the ciliary ganglion. Uh, this is the sign, dilated pupil, sluggish or no reaction, sector iris polarisis, and con uh, can be constrict to 0.1% pilocaprin. The causes will be a local, systemic, uh, the most uh, um, usual one is the IDIS. The IDIS syndrome is usually unilateral. Two to 50 years uh, a patient, a woman is more than a man, accommodation reduced or absent, slow pupillary constriction, iris sectors, uh, Palsy, decreased deep tendon reflex, and natural history pupil smaller and accommodation improve. If we can see here in dark little anisocoria, in light, the right pupil does not constrict. This one. Near stimulus, right pupil constricts with stimulus near. Accommodation relax, the right slow redilate. Uh, and after pilocarpine, maximal constrictions on right eye because of super sensitive. This woman is 35 years old, blur of the left eye, two weeks. History of autoimmune disease since 2015. For this adistonic, we have to careful follow up, careful examinations of carinal nerve tree. This is the summary. If you have an isocoria greater and isocoria in light, larger pupil, you have ptosis, motility, abnormality. You have to think of third nerve palsy. You have to do MRI, MRI, MRI or MRI of brain or orbit, and consider CTA. If there's no full motility, no ptosis, there's segmental constriction and light on near dissociation, you have to dilute pilocarpin. If it's a constriction, it will be a tonic pupil. If it's not constrict, you have to uh, do it with the pilocarpin non dilute. No constriction will be pharmacological midriasis. If it's greater in asocoria in small pupil, you have to test with aproconidine, um, dilation of abnormal pupil. Uh, will be a Horner syndrome. You have to localize clinically. For children, you have to check also the pelvis because Horner syndrome in children is um, associated with neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma. Equal anisocoria, you have to think it is a physiologic anisocoria. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cynthia, for your presentation. Before we proceed, uh, I want to remind to all participants, please type your questions at the chat box. We will try to answer your questions. So now we will proceed to our last speaker for this station, Professor Clementine. Good morning, everyone. We are very uh, honored to have you as one of the speakers today. So first, allow me to read Professor Clementine curriculum vitae. So Professor Clementine 
is Associate Professor and Senior Consultant of National University Hospital, Singapore. He is the Head of Department of Ophthalmology, National University Hospital, and National University of Singapore. He is Chief Examiner of Masters of Medicine Ophthalmology. He is Chief of Eye Surgery Services at Alexandra Hospital, and he is Board Member of Asian Neuro Ophthalmology Society. So please, Professor Clementan, you may proceed to start your presentation. Thank you all very much. And again, I must say what a pleasure it is to uh, share with you something of what we know. Uh, and we've had really great presentations so far from the Dr. Siddiq and from Dr. Cynthia. Uh, I hope you all have taken on board a lot of those learning points and you may find that some of them link to what I'm going to talk about in ocular movement disorders. Now, I share with you something that my professor in, in neurology taught us. So long ago, there wasn't neuro-ophthalmology. There was just a neurologist who did this. And Professor Lung Si Chin, a very eminent neurologist in Singapore, taught us these three rules. Actually, there's a fourth rule, which I'll, I'll tell you all later in the talk. The first rule is that all cranial nerve nuclei are located in the brainstem, except for the olfactory nerve and the optic nerve. Uh, the second is that all cranial nerves will pass through the meninges. So if you have... a uh, a cranial nerve palsy of some sort, do consider whether the meninges are involved uh, in, in this, especially if you have multiple cranial neuropathies. The third is that the cranial nerves are often found in groups. So if you see here on the pictures that I have uh, um, shown you, in the upper right picture, you see that besides the cranial nerve nuclei, which are present in the brainstem, actually there are some nuclei, the supranuclear portions, uh, that are present in the brainstem, and it, it would be good to remember which ones they are, where they are, and what they control. So, for vertical gaze, you will see their RIMLF, which is the rostral interstitial nucleus of the medial longitudinal fasciculus, as well as the interstitial nucleus of Cajal. Uh, these two are responsible for vertical movements. And then, lower down in the lower down in the pons, you have the parapontine reticular formation, the PPRF which is responsible for uh, conjugate horizontal uh, eye movements. Uh, remembering this helps you, remembering where these are helps you to uh, determine where some of the lesions are uh, when you see certain clinical signs. And then you see where all the cranial nerves, in the left-hand picture, you see where all the cranial nerves emerge. And it's important to remember what their neighbors are. So if you look at the abducens nerve, which I've circled in red, you see that it's actually not very far away when the nerves meet from the vestibular cochlea or the eighth nerve, as well as the facial nerve. Now, they look a bit far apart here, but uh, believe me, when they come a little bit closer towards the uh, petrous temporal, they are, they are quite closely related. Uh, and just a little bit above them is the trigeminal nerve. Right. Now, one grouping, as I said, cranials appear in groups. One grouping that we are all familiar with is the cavernous sinus. And Cynthia earlier showed you uh, that uh, Horner syndrome might be associated with a cavernous sinus lesion when you have other cranial neuropathies such as the uh, third nerve as well as the uh, sixth nerve, you know, particularly the sixth nerve which is in the middle and is near the internal carotid artery, uh, uh, the internal carotid artery as it passes through the cavernous sinus. A second uh, useful point to remember is the actions of the individual extraocular muscles. For the medial and lateral recti, it's very straightforward. But for the vertical uh, muscles, or the muscles responsible for vertical movement, I want to especially point out to you that they, they have one component of action which is torsional, especially the obliques, which uh, uh, the superior oblique um, primary action is in torsion, and the inferior obliques primary action is excyclotorsion. But you see, you don't see this on a regular basis because they are mixed in together with the rest of the eye movements. And therefore, we normally look for the action of the superior oblique in when, the, when you have the patient look in and downwards. So it is depression in adduction, right? So, so they will, that is the action of the uh, superior oblique. Now, one interesting, uh, uh, and that, that the interesting feature about this, therefore, is when you lose the adduction in the third nerve palsy, you suddenly can see the in torsion of the superior oblique. So we don't normally observe this, 
But it is important to remember because when you have a superior oblique palsy, uh, you tend to get, uh, or any of the vertical muscles are weak, you tend to get a little bit of a torsional diplopia. In other words, it's not just strictly vertical, but sometimes torsional as well. So the patient will describe images looking tilted, one, the double image looking tilted. Now I've tried to imitate uh, Cynthia and try a nice flow chart to try to capture the way that neuro-ophthalmologists think about their patients. And so here we have the principal symptom of uh, um, uh, ocular movement disorders, and that is diplopia, right? The other one is, of course, oscillopsia from uh, nystagmus, but we will just focus on diplopia for today. Now, when you have a patient, when we have a patient with diplopia, we'd like to know, first of all, whether this is monocular or binocular. And the first simple test to do is ask the patient to close one eye at a time, and also sometimes to use a pinhole. Sometimes you need to use a pinhole over both eyes in order to determine whether there is a component of both monocular and binocular diplopia uh, for that patient. And a great test for determining uh, um, um, monocular or binocular diplopia is sometimes the worth four dot test. A very simple test, it's, it's present on nearly every uh, visual acuity projector and all you need is red and green filters to test if the patient has truly a uh, binocular diplopia. If patient has a monocular diplopia, actually the rest is straightforward, right? You simply uh, 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 put a pinhole to see if it improves. You examine the rest of the eye from the tear film to the retina, do our favorite test in ophthalmology now called the OCT. And then uh, you determine where the source of the diplopia is, whether it's a tear film, cornea, lens, or macula. But we're more interested, of course, in binocular diplopia. And I've listed out for you the examination, the necessary examination that one must do to try to determine uh, where the binocular diplopia comes from. So we test typically pursuit eye movements, which are versions, okay, uh, observing both eyes together, ductions, which is observing just the movement of one eye, and vergences, which is uh, observing the eyes converge or diverge. It's useful to do saccades because they help you to certain diagnosis. Uh, the vestibular ocular reflex, where you turn the patient's head while, while having them fixed on your nose. Uh, optokinetic nystagmus test, uh, cover test, very, very important and much underrated, uh, as well as the force duction test, which we sometimes avoid doing because we don't want to, 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 to grab hold of a patient's eye in the clinic. But I assure you that all these are extremely important. And as you have learned earlier, you know, the other signs are also important, such as the pupils. Right. Pupils are very important. It's also important to look at the eyelids. And then, as you have seen from Dr. Siddick's lecture, the optic nerve is actually very close to a number of the cranial nerves at the apex of the orbit. And you therefore, it's important to complete your examination with visual fields, color, vision, visual acuity, and not forgetting for, for, uh, for uh, uh, the examination of the patient in a, in, with uh, diplopia is a neurological examination. But as important, if not maybe sometimes more important the examination is the history. And you always ask the patient the direction of the diplopia, the onset, the duration, was it variable? Did it change during the day? Does it get worse when he's tired? And the progression. Because acute lesions that don't progress, acute Diplopia that does not progress tends to refer to uh, ischemic or it may be inflammatory conditions. But any diplopia that's progressive or variable should lead you to look for other lesions. And so after all that history and physical examination, we, we parcel our thinking into a few different things and we'll start from right to left. Okay, So first, we always hope to just see an isolated cranial neuropathy just a single cranial nerve palsy, that's easy to deal with. And then we will uh, be able to look either for the nerve to be involved or the nucleus to be involved. And those are easy to deal with. Things get a little bit harder when you have more than one cranial nerve uh, involved. But if you remember Lung's uh, rules that the cranial nerves appear in groups, right? The other cranial neuropathies that occur should give you a clue as to uh, where, the, where the location, where the lesion is. And we know that uh, uh, cranial nerves three, four, five, and six are located together at the cavernous sinus. 
and uh, five, six, seven, eight are close to the cerebellopontine angle. The least will tell you where you ought to look. When it comes to supranuclear palsies, now a lot of them actually cause a symmetrical loss of uh, eye movements. But often, if you have something occurring in the brainstem, what causes the diplopia is a skew deviation. And that's when the one eye is slightly elevated compared to the other. Finally, when everything seems to be normal, right? but you still have a bit of double vision and you've done your cover test and you have found a little bit of a squint, make sure that you test this uh, squint. You do the cover test in all the gaze positions, primary position, left gaze, right gaze, up, down, and with the head tilts. Right? And, with, and if the squint is committent, it means it's the same angle wherever the patient is looking, then you possibly have a decompensated committent squint. But again, this is a diagnosis of exclusion and not to be made in a child. Right? If you have a child, that, uh, not to be made easily or lightly in a child, if you have a child with what you think is a decompensated committent squint, you really need to scan the brain because sometimes that is the reason why the child appears to have a new onset uh, squint. Not forgetting our favorite friend, the neuromuscular junction and this disease that seems to fit everything, uh, myasthenia gravis. Having then located, located the site uh, of the lesion causing the double vision, we now have to think of the cause and that's where the history again becomes important as well as the examination because you are now thinking of all these causes, ischemia, inflammation, infection, neoplasia, uh, toxicity, trauma, inherited disease, and even degenerative disease. Now, and the first step to determining all these is not the MRI or the blood test. The first step to determining all this is the history and the examination. Thereafter, you would do an MRI. Uh, CSF studies uh, are very important, and as well as uh, uh, blood investigations. One important note about MRIs, though, is for you to remember that you get what you order. So if you order a whole brain MRI without specifically telling the radiologist where to look, you will get just that and you will not be able to make a diagnosis. Particularly when looking for isolated cranial nerve palsies and you're, you're not sure if it is a microvascular nerve palsy or ischemic, you need to ask the radiologist to give you uh, a, uh, to, to zoom in on the specific cranial nerves and they do have special sequences for that. Bear in mind, of course, that uh, certain cranial neuropathies, uh, isolated cranial neuropathies, right, have a variety of causes. And, you know, by, by far, the largest group actually is undetermined, meaning we never really find the cause. Now, as time is running on, here, is a, here are a couple of quiz questions. So I want you all to have a look at this picture. I'm going to pause for just a minute for you to have a look at this. And if you have a piece of paper with you, just scribble down the diagnosis. The answers will be revealed at the end, right? So the first, uh, first, first patient here clearly has a right-sided ptosis. Uh, and uh, just to help you along, it does not appear that he can move the right eye very well. Okay, this one is pretty straightforward. And the question you should be asking yourself is, what else do I need to examine? This is a video. I have a look at this uh, patient's eye nose. movements. And you can see that uh, uh, as she attempts to look to the, to the left side, there is a little bit of a nystagmus, a, a fairly fine and fast nystagmus. Okay, I just point that out to you to help us all try to answer this question. And as she looks to the right, and she is trying very hard to look to the right, she again has a nystagmus, but it is a bit, the, the amplitude is a bit bigger and it is a bit slower than when she looks to the left, as you can see here again, right? So, so. She, these are her eye movements, and you saw she was not really able to AB duct the left eye. If it looked like she could not bring the, uh, sorry, could not AB duct the right eye, okay? But you can see that in the left eye, the better eye, is, as she attempts to move towards the nose, she actually sort of can move, but it's a bit difficult as well. But uh, I assure you that her A deduction on the left eye, means the medial rectus on the left eye, was functioning completely normally, right? Now, to move on Don't a little bit left. with this, uh, this, this just is a few more seconds. Right. You can see her eye movements in, in all the depression and then elevation seem to be pretty good, right, uh, so far. You also notice this little green tinge on the right eye, which will give you a kind of clue what we are, what we are looking at. 
close and now eyes. we complete the rest of the examination with her trying to close her eyes smile and, and then teeth. her trying to give us a smile all right okay, that gives away all the answer already you know what the, problem this patient has right moving on to the next video question three this patient is attempting to look to the right and uh well the right eye seems to move to the right with a little bit of nystagmus and now she's attempting to look to the left okay you probably can guess what this is immediately. It's quite simple. But the main question is, what is the major sign to determine this condition? What is the one sign that does not change whenever this, whenever you see a patient with this condition? All right. Next, you have an MRI here, and the arrow is pointing you to uh, the potential site of the lesion. I'd like you to try to describe what you see as the lesion on this MRI. And then also what you see in the histological specimen uh, up in the top right of your screen. So where and what is this, where is this lesion? What does the MRI show? And what's up there in the histology? We actually managed to get a biopsy for this patient. Okay, now this one, a quick one. There are patterns of disease that, are, that we sometimes observe. Okay, and when you see this pattern, you start to think of a particular condition. And so the first one is if you see this pattern of ophthalmoplegia, areflexia, and ataxia, what do you think of? B, if you see ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and confusion, what do you think of? C, if you see lid retraction, lid lag, proptosis, and limitation of eye movements, oh, this one's real easy. I'm sure all of you can get this one. And then D, if you, if, if you see an eye movement, uh, uh, limited eye movements that are chronic, progressive, bilateral, uh, symmetrical with ptosis uh, and the pupils are uninvolved, the saccades are slow and the patient has cataracts, what do you think of? And finally, one good uh, nine gaze uh, position of photo, have a look and see if you can figure what this patient has. Okay, I'll pause for a minute so that you can see uh, as she looks left, right, up, down, you know, nowadays there's even an app called Nine Gaze on your, which you can probably download on your mobile phones, where you can take this. And Nine Gaze photos are a great way to communicate with one another. And I want to express my thanks to uh, my colleague Dr. Hazel Lim, uh, the, the other neuro ophthalmologist at NUH, who essentially has forced all our residents to communicate with us by taking Nine Gaze photos. So now it's become a habit, and it's a really wonderful habit because we have plenty of records to tell us uh, what's happening to each of the patients. We can watch their progression. And so this is in the 21st century, probably the correct way to record, to, to do medical records. Okay, answers. The first one easy was a complete third nerve palsy. And if you can see here, this slightly out of focus photo, the right pupil was slightly larger than the left. And so the answer was, you need to look at the pupils whenever you're examining a third nerve palsy. The second lady with a bit of fluorescein stain on the right eye had a, had a cerebellopontine angle and she had a right six and seven nerve palsy as well as hearing loss. And, she, and that kind of nystagmus is a Brun's nystagmus, which is the slow, the slow and wide amplitude nystagmus toward the side of the lesion and a fast, uh, uh, smaller amplitude one away from the lesion. The third, uh, the third patient had a bilateral uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia and the key sign of an internuclear ophthalmoplegia is the isolated loss of adduction, adduction. The nystagmus is not always present, but the loss of adduction usually is. Uh, the MRI showed you a enhancing lesion in the left cavernous sinus, and the histology, for those of you who can still remember your histology, showed a granuloma, so it's granulomatous inflammation. Question five, which are different parts. So if you have ophthalmoplegia, irreflexia, and ataxia, you think of Miller Fisher. If you have ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and confusion, Wernicke and cephalopathy. If you have uh, lid lag, lid retraction uh, uh, together with proptosis and all that, you think of thyroid eye disease. And the last one, progressive ophthalmoplegia with uh, pupil smearing and cataracts, you think of myotonic dystrophy. The last patient did not seem to have a particular pattern. And when you have no pattern, I hope some of you put down myasthenia because here she is after you have a... Uh, 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 after you've given her a bit of new stick mean to test for that, right? Now, uh, I, I, I wish I could give out prizes. If this were a face-to-face -face thing, I would have a prize here for whoever had all the right answers. Uh, you can congratulate yourself if you've got the correct answers. I hope, I hope most of you have got that correct. Uh, once again, it's been my pleasure to share this with you. 
Uh, and I really do hope to meet up with all of you soon. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you, Professor Clementine, for your presentation. So now we will move to uh, our discussion session. Uh, first, I will read the questions for Dr. Sidi. For long LHON, can we detect this earlier before vision impairment occurs, for example, with ERG or et cetera? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Diela. Yes, uh, actually, uh, I don't have any experience about detect early detection uh, for long patient with active physiologic examination. But uh, sometimes, uh, patient with uh, have mutation without any symptoms can be detected. For example, I, I have uh, patients. Uh, two brothers patients. One uh, patient, the, the older one is had a symptom of uh, facial dysfunction and the little brother don't have any symptoms. But when we check the mutation, there is uh, mutation, but there is, uh, she, he, he didn't have any symptoms. So I don't know if, uh, so about the, the answer, the question about is, can we detect uh, long earlier uh, in patient without any symptoms uh, i don't i don't see i don't i, I don't have i don't have any any opinion about that even uh, if, when we have any uh electrophysiologic symptoms but sometimes uh, maybe it might be uh, there is symptoms uh, slight symptom for example uh, disorder of uh, visual nerve, uh, optic nerve disorders such, such as uh, contrast sensitivity maybe or uh, color vision. Uh, but uh, well, I, don't, I don't have any experience about that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sidi, for your question. So uh, our next question is for Dr. Cynthia. Um, is anthocorea due to aneurysm always accompanied by extreme headache? Is there any patients with this, but without extreme headache? Yes, thank you, moderator. Um, the um, characteristic of the patients with a painful um, ophthalmoplegia with an esochoria is accompanied by headache. But um, I found um, these uh, patients without headache, but the um, um, ocular movement is not too totally the ptosis is only uh, two millimeter and um, the ocular movement is not uh, all impaired. So uh, on this kind of patients, um, uh, we have to also suspect it of aneurysms. And um, if the aneurysm is not too big, maybe the patient is not complaining of headaches. Mostly of patients with double vision, they complain also headache, but not that... Um, 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 severe headaches. Maybe that's the question. So uh, it can be without headaches also. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cynthia. So uh, the next question is for Professor Clementine. If a child complains of diplopia, good vision, and there is no squint, what should we check besides brain MRI or CT? Should we do blood tests? So please, uh, Professor Clementine, you may answer this question. Thank you. Sorry, could you just uh, could you repeat the question again? I, I missed some part of it. Okay. If a child complains of diplopia, good vision, and there is no squint, what should we check besides brain MRI or CT? Should we do blood tests? I, I think for a child or for any patient who has diplopia but no uh, uh, no, no obvious uh, ocular motility disorder. You have to try to get down to the, the bottom of it first before we jump into the uh, MRI or blood test. Because uh, if in a patient with diplopia, you almost, uh, with, with, with a true binocular diplopia, if it's truly a binocular diplopia, you almost, almost always have a sign, right? Now, one situation where you sometimes do not really have a, a good signs 
is when you have an intermittent squint, or if let's say you have myasthenia, and children can have myasthenia, and at the point of examination, nothing is present. It is, it is possible, and we have seen such patients. If you have, if but the history must match. The history must be that of intermittent diplopia, meaning it's not always present, only sometimes. Now, if that is the case, then uh, the first thing I would, uh, the, 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 the test I would have the parents do is to do uh, uh, videos of the child's eye movements or eye position whenever the child complains of the diplopia. In other words, we can't see it all the time, but some parents and caregivers are often with children at the time, ask them to do that. And very quickly, especially if the, uh, uh, in the diplopia you know, occurs a few times in a week, very quickly you will have a, a video record of something. So first, do a very, very good cover test do the stereo vision tests uh, because those help you to determine whether there is any you know, loss of binocular vision. Uh, and then try to get photos or video recordings from uh, patients. Because I, I had one adult patient who later turned out to really have a, a six nerve palsy who basically had intermittent uh, flow through a vertebral artery uh, and later on had a stroke. But all he had was intermittent diplopia and we couldn't catch it except for the fact that his wife had taken a picture right a picture so uh, uh, these are all useful uh, before you jump into an MRI of course if if I understand in, in, in the situation where where the uh, where, um, where where your patients live very far away and can only spend a little bit of time then doing an MRI in the first instance just to assure everyone that there's no major lesion in the brain like a mass lesion or dilated ventricles or that may be helpful Okay, but I think we will have to take our patients as they come. And the correct way is really to try to determine what is the cause of the uh, diplopia. Thank you, Professor Clementine, for your explanation. So the next question is for Dr. Cynthia. In the case of we suspect a patient with Horner syndrome and we don't have a diluted cocaine and hydroxyamphetamine eye drop, can we go straight to imaging evaluation to determine preganglionic or postganglionic cause? Yes, uh, thank you, moderator. Thank you for the questions. Um, the cocaine, the aprochloridine, the hydroxyamphetamine is uh, really it's very difficult to get. So um, if uh, as I mentioned before in my slide, there is a clue for the uh, whether it is a, a preganglionic central or postganglionic. You have to see the clue for the patients, the clinical clue, uh, the, the clinical clue of the patients. But um, if you want to do uh, straight to the imaging, because if we have to uh, ask for the imaging for the radiologist, we have to know whether this is uh, for the brainstem area, for the cervical area. So um, from the uh, clinical uh, view, you have to see whether this is a, a central preganglionic or postganglionic. So um, for the example, if there is an anhydrosis only in the forehead area, you have to think this is um, um, the postganglionic. But if it's all the face uh, side, on the uh, lesions of the Horner, you have to think this is a central or uh, preganglionic. So if you order the MRI or the TA or, uh, or anything from the imaging, you have to think before uh, we ask for the imaging. So the radiologist also can uh, help us find where is the exact lesions of the uh, Horner syndrome. Maybe that's the questions, Dr. Adil and Kirsten. Thank you, Dr. Cynthia. And for the next question is for Dr. Sidi. For toxic neuropathy due to methanol, is there any evidence for high dose methylprednisolone IV, such as in ONTT? Thank you, Dr. Dela. Uh, exactly for toxic optic neuropathy, there is no uh, uh, certain medications. You can. Uh, but in our clinic, yes, there is some evidence that several patients uh, show increasing and visual acuity when we give them intravenous methylprednisolone. 
uh, usually usually we give we gave them one gram per day divided in four doses like we give uh, for optic neuritis but if there is no uh, evidence uh, for improving the visual acuity then we stop the metoprolol but this is for the i think for the for the new patients for the patient if uh, if the patient have uh, or the patient if uh, if the patient came to our clinic with uh, uh, optic dispeller and i mean in uh, with optic atrophy then we can give anything for him okay thank you dr sidik for your answer so for uh, the next uh, last question um, for professor clementan how do you diagnose the compensated defense screen considering it is an exclusion diagnosis and what is the management for this condition Thank you, Prof. Professor Clement. Tan. Yes, Can thank you, you for the question. Clearly? Yes, I heard that. I heard that. And thank you for the question. You are absolutely correct that it is largely a diagnosis of exclusion. And by that, I mean that one must do a few things. First of all, uh, the examination of the history must be very complete. Then you must be able to demonstrate from the cover test that the squint is truly committant. Because if you have an incommittent squint, it is not safe to make a diagnosis of a decompensated squint. After that, there are two ways to go about <clears throat> making this diagnosis of exclusion. One is, of course, if the patient can afford it and you are concerned, uh, and we're speaking of adult patients here, uh, you go ahead and do a CT scan or an MRI of the brain anyway because the patient is worried that he has a tumor and you say, look, there's nothing here, so don't worry about it. Uh, for a child, as I said earlier, for a child, uh, it is not safe to say decompensated squint. If you have a child with a new onset strabismus, please scan the child. Uh, but back to the adult again. Uh, once you have satisfied yourself that nothing, nothing uh, serious is wrong, then um, you follow up the patient. Because a decompensated squint, it may change, but it will always, it may change in its angle, but it will always remain largely committed. Okay, and to treat it, you have options. You know, I've had patients who've chosen to have surgery. Uh, there are also patients who've chosen to just live with it and they wear prisms or they just live with it and they wear nothing at all, depending on how bad their decompensation is. So frenal prisms or ground-in prisms into the glasses, uh, um, as well as um, uh, strabismus surgery are all uh, valid treatments uh, for those who have a persistent uh, diplopia with a decompensated squint. Okay, thank you very much for your explanation, Professor Clementan. I think we still have uh, time, so uh, we will have uh, this last question. So the last question is also for Professor Clementan. How do you usually assess for, for divergence or convergence problems for the cause of acute diplopia? What would you suggest next for those cases? Uh, so, so for convergence and divergence, you know, you, you realize that uh, you cannot diverge your eyes or move your eyes apart any further than primary position and looking straight ahead. Nobody can make their eyes go sideways this way except the chameleon. Uh, so really what we are testing when it comes to convergence and diversion is convergence. And so you bring, you give them, uh, you bring a target and you move it towards their nose. Right? And then you move the target from the nose away from them and you watch the eyes diverge. So that is convergence and divergence. Now we have a very old tool for measuring convergence and divergence. It's called the RAF rule. And I don't know how many of you still have an RAF rule in your, in your hospitals, uh, but it's a useful tool at, you know, to measure how far away from the nose uh, a, a patient can converge. Right. So sometimes in an acute loss of Convergent, I think you're possibly referring to whoever the, the person asked question, something like convergence insufficiency, right? If you have convergence insufficiency, you very likely also have a squint, uh, a, a exophoria or exotropia, alternating exotropia, which is worse for near than it is for distance. So that's an additional sign that you may have, right? But use the RAF rule, or, or RAF rule is simply a ruler with a target attached to it that you bring close to the nose. And for young individual uh, in their 20s and all, they ought to be able to converge up to about five centimeters from the nose. Of course, as you get older and you hit your 50s and 60s, the convergence may not be as good as all that. 
But the RAF row one useful thing is it does give you an age-related normal convergence at the site of one of the measurements. So that's a, a one tool that you can use for convergence and divergence. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Clementan, for your answers. Unfortunately, the time is up. So we are sorry that we cannot answer all of the questions. Thank you very much for all the speakers, Professor Clementan, Dr. Cynthia, and Dr. Siddiq. Thank you for your willingness to share your time and expertise to all of us. Before I conclude this meeting, is there anything you would like to say or comment, Professor Clementan? Uh, yes, I saw one of the questions. Sorry, there was one of the questions from the Q&A that happened to talk about uh, something I thought was important, which is uh, um, for a patient who looks like they've got typical optic neuritis, and the question was, do we have to do the, uh, uh, the rest of the diagnostic tests to eliminate infection, uh, especially since HIV is more prevalent? And the answer is yes. And it's not just looking for infections, but because right now we know, and it is really prevalent in Asia, that we have neuromyelitis optica. So, did, so besides excluding infections, uh, that means doing an MRI and CSF studies, trying to determine if the patient indeed has NMO by testing the antibodies or MOC is very important, not just for prognostication, but it's going to determine how you're going to manage the patient, whether you put them on long-term immunosuppression or only short-term immunosuppression. So if you have access to these, and I, and I, and I, and I understand that access is a, is a difficult uh, uh, thing, but if you have access to the test, do the test because it does really uh, determine how we're going to manage the patients in the future. What we used to think about as typical optic neuritis um, arising from multiple sclerosis isn't as common as that as we once thought in Asia. And I'm sure Dr. Siddiq will and Mr. Siddiq will attest to that, that as you test them, you find, oh my goodness, everyone that we thought had multiple sclerosis actually turns out to have NMO instead. So, so do, do test the patients. It's, it, it is quite important nowadays. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Clementan. So I think because we have reached to the end of this session, thank you very much for all the speakers. Um, so uh, for the participants, please stay with us because we will soon uh, proceed to next session. Thank you. with drugs and an invasive surgery. Iridex bridges this gap with a Micropulse P3 device, an innovation in transclerocyclophotocoagulation powered by the Cyclo G6 glaucoma laser system. With standard laser technology, a continuous beam is delivered to the tissue, leading to heat buildup that may cause tissue damage. Micropulse technology chops that laser beam into trains of repetitive on and off pulses. A controlled perspective study performed at the National University Hospital Singapore resulted in a 33% reduction in IOP at 18 months and medications were reduced from a mean of 2.1 to 1.3. The laser console is efficient and straightforward for the physician and the patient. Micropulse P3 can be performed in the office or in the OR and is highly efficient. Setup is easy. morning. Thank you for all participants who are still staying with us. So now I will open our second session. This session will also have three speakers. At the end of the session, we will have discussion. So allow me to invite our first speaker, Dr. Astrianda. Dr. Astrianda Nadia Suryono, Specialist Mata Consultant, 
is a glaucoma consultant of the Department of Ophthalmology, Cipto Mangun Kusumo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. She is the Secretary of Persatuan Dr. Mata Indonesia Perdami. She is board member of Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. She is regional secretary of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. She had fellowship on glaucoma in National University Hospital and also fellowship on pediatric glaucoma in Moorfields Eye Hospital. So please, Dr. Ashanda, you may proceed your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Biela. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers as well. And first and foremost, I'd like to express my gratitude to Professor Tan and Professor Chu for their time and for their collaboration. I'm truly honored to share this session together with you. So um, my talk will be about anterior segment imaging in glaucoma. I have no financial disclosure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some of the pictures and slides are from Menu H back from my days in training uh, with Professor Chu. So thank you for allowing me to borrow these pictures. Um, I'd like to start by reminding us of these important pathologies in glaucoma and that anterior chamber and angle structure understanding is crucial, especially in diagnosing angle closure versus open angle. So why is it important to examine the anterior segment uh, firstly, of course, for diagnosis purposes, we want to determine the subtypes of glaucoma and we want to be able to know if any secondary angle closure um, causes are present. And secondly, we want to evaluate the outcomes of our treatment. For instance, we want to know if there's any changes in the angle structure after we did the laser or is there any progression of uh, the angle closure or residual angle closure. And we also want to, to evaluate the condition of our blab or tube position should we encounter some blab or tube related problems. So what are the ways to evaluate uh, anterior segments? These are the ones uh, that has already been uh, around for several years. The shine fluke photography, ultrasound by microscopy, uh, anterior segment uh, OCT, which has uh, developed over time into uh, better resolutions. And uh, there's also the red cam. It was developed to give wide field photographs of the pediatric fundus. However, with the addition of a uh, specific lens and modification to the technique, the device now can be used for imaging the anterior segment. And this is called the eye cam. And also there's this new OCT uh, that uh, it's called swept source OCT, which enables us to see a 3D imaging of the anterior uh, segment. So uh, with the interest of time, I will just talk about the ASOCT and UBM. Uh, first, we will uh, discuss about ASOCT. It is first described uh, in 1991 by Huang uh, Group, and this is actually for posterior segment uh, imaging. But several years after that, it has been uh, gone through several modifications and have improved the imaging of anterior segment structures. And it has a uh, less dependent on technique. It's uh, uh, used in the dark room with, with infrared to minimize pupil constriction caused by illumination. There's a, it's a non-contact uh, technique with rapid image acquisition. Um, ASOCT uses reflect, reflected light to image tissue structures with high resolution. This technique compares the delay and intensity of light reflected from tissue structures relative to light that has traveled a reference path of known length. Uh, in this uh, older version of ASOCT, the time domain OCT, A scans are generated by varying the position of the reference mirror. And the ASOCT may, may be incorporated as a part of a modified slit lamp uh, system. So these images uh, are the ones that uh, are quite strikingly different, the open angle and the narrow angles. I will talk about them uh, more detailed later. So uh, the time domain ASOCT can also identify the anatomic level of the block, uh, which gives us clue as to what is the mechanism or the dominant mechanism of angle closure, such as a pupil block, the plateau iris shape, or uh, the iris roll, or thick iris, and of course the lens factor. Here we can see the pupil block uh, very nicely uh, with the uh, convex of the iris, which we can uh, probably see in the slit lamp as um, iris bombay, uh, if it's very severe or it's very uh, dramatic. And uh, this uh, second shape is the plateau iris shape. We can see the iris root is uh, 
forming a sort of like a wedge shaped and uh, this is uh, also a mechanism that's well known and quite uh, prevalent in the angle closure cases. And there's this iris roll or uh, the thickness of the iris which can cause uh, uh, angle crowding when the pupil is maximal dilated. And the bulky lens here, uh, later we will talk about it, uh, how to measure it uh, objectively. So this uh, shows that um, uh, lens factor is dominant in the angle closure and therefore perhaps needs a specific treatment of uh, lens extraction. The time domain ASOCT can also assess the efficacy of laser treatment. These images showed that uh, the, first, uh, the, um, the first one is uh, patient has undergone a peripheral iridotomy. Uh, before the PI, we can see the iris concave quite uh, uh, significantly. And after the, we create the pupil, uh, sorry, the iridotomy, then the uh, iris has gone uh, a little bit flattened and therefore uh, the, uh, allows the angles to uh, open it a little bit. And uh, the second part is the uh, eye that has undergone um, iridoplasty. Uh, which normally we do in plateau iris configuration. We can see here the iris uh, shape is uh, like plateau. Yeah, in the in the iris root there's a wedge shape, and after the iridoplasty, we can see the iris root uh, the iris root has uh, moved away from the trabecular meshwork and allows it to open. This is just to show the uh, difference of spectral or uh, the newer type of ASOCT, the spectral or Fourier domain, which has a, a resolution uh, scan, shows a trabecular meshwork here, uh, and um, anterior iris surface contact with greater detail as opposed to the uh, time domain one. It is important to uh, create a landmark in ASOCT because uh, for, quality, for quantitative assessment of the different uh, uh, anterior segment parameters, uh, prior identification of a landmark is necessary. And scleral spur, you can see here, is one such anatomical landmark because it's uh, easier to detect. Uh, you can see it's hyper-reflective uh, image here. And that that's actually uh, the end of the sclera that is slightly protruding. So it's easier to for us to see scleral spur uh, as opposed to see other uh, different structures in the anterior segment. Uh, so with scleral spur, we can uh, then um, detect or, or uh, define where the trabecular meshworks are. So the trabecular meshwork is usually positioned 250 to 500 micron anterior to the scleral spur along uh, the angle wall. So these are the quantitative measurements that can be uh, generated from an image of an SOCT. There are uh, many measurements, but I just want to highlight two of them, which is the ACD or the uh, anterior uh, chamber depth is uh, that is defined as the actual distance between the corneal endothelium and the anterior lens surface. And also uh, it is important to uh, measure the LV here. You can see it's uh, the lens vault which uh, defined as a um, perpendicular distance between the anterior lens surface and to the midpoint of an imaginary line drawn through both scleral spurs. So if you take an imaginary, li imaginary line from both scleral spur and the midpoint, uh, you take a, a, a line up, up to the central part or the anterior part of the lens, then that's the uh, what's we call what is called the lens uh, um, lens vault, and if the lens vault is very protruded or it's very huge, then we can uh, probably uh, then it probably suggested that the main mechanism of the angle closure is the lens factor, and so we will have to think of uh, uh, a, a, a type of treatment that's specifically addressing that, which is a cataract extraction. Let's move on to the newest or the latest OCT that is called the swept source OCT. It's actually a form of Fourier domain OCT and it uses a monochromatic tunable fast scanning laser source. And uh, with construction, with reconstruction of individual image frames, a 3D display of the iris and the anterior chamber angle can be generated. It's able to visualize scleral spur and the Schwalbe's line in high resolution, resolution scan mode and the anterior chamber uh, angle configuration can be visualized, visualized for 
the whole 360 degree in less than two seconds. These are the anatomical landmarks uh, in SS OCT. Uh, like the other types of OCT, scleral spur is easily uh, um, identified, but with the uh, high density scan, you can also detect the uh, Schlem's canal over here, very tiny, and the uh, Schwab's line. But with lower density of SS OCT, you can still see the uh, only the scleral spur. This is another uh, SS OCT usage by um, a study by uh, Tun. Uh, uh, showed that there's a difference of phacoemulsification alone and phacoemulsification with goniosinicheolysis. And these are all demonstrated with an SSOCT. So you can see here in the uh, picture A and C is the uh, iris trabecular contact before surgery in groups that has only phacoemulsification, the A1, and the C is the group uh, that is going to have a phacoemulsification and goniosinicheolysis. So post-op, uh, we could see here from the inlet picture here, this is a, actually the uh, insert picture is a 2D image, and it shows a more reduction of iris trabecular contact in the goniosinicheolysis group. So you can see that there's a nice uh, image here that can be uh, seen almost 360 uh, degree uh, area of the angle, uh, angle and it's uh, high resolution. So the ASOCT can also be used to evaluate the bleb. And why is it important? Because bleb morphology can be uh, can uh, give us clue as to uh, what our future bleb function would be. So it's a predictor for future bleb function. And the features uh, that are shown in the image uh, by ASOCT is the bleb wall. Here is the bleb wall. And also uh, a space in the subkanjang taiva as well as in the suprascleral that is fluid filled or aqueous filled. And we could also view nicely the scleral flap and the sclerotomy. Um, uh, this two studies I would like to highlight because these two studies actually uh, features or uh, explore what are the functioning blab look like in an ASOCT image. So um, both studies have uh, agreed that a functioning blab would will uh, show or demonstrate uh, several features such as the hyperreflectivity of the blab wall that has uh, a microcyst in the blab walls and it shows a good uh, filtrating function and also uh, a blab that has a, a inter sorry subkanjang tival subkanjang tival space that are uh, quite big it's also correlated with a better functioning blab and the non-functioning blab will show the, the opposite, which is the hyperreflectivity of the blab wall, which probably we can see it clinically as an encapsulated blab. And of course, with a uh, with subconjunctival space absent is also correlated with non-functioning blab. Let's move on to the UBM. It's a uh, high frequency ultrasound B scan system that allows viewing and acquisition of real time images under magnification. It is able uh, uh, to image structures behind the iris. So this is uh, one of the advantages. And it's helping, uh, it's very good to, ha uh, to help us understand mechanism of angle closure and monitoring other possible conditions such as the UVL cyst or the anterior rotation of ciliary body. Unfortunately, it requires eye contact and skilled operator. So there's a learning curve to operate the UBM and it's rather time consuming. So these are the images uh, that we can acquire from a UBM. Uh, this is how a pupillary block look like with a UBM and a plateau iris configuration. Yeah? And also what is uh, special about UBM is that you can view uh, a condition uh, after the, uh, behind the iris. So in this case, this uh, is iridociliary cyst, which probably clinically can be uh, misdiagnosed as a plateau iris configuration. But if we uh, look again with the UBM, we can see that it's not a plateau iris, uh, a pure plateau. It's just, it's because of the iris cyst that is pushing uh, forward the iris and making it like a plateau, so it's called a pseudo-plateau. 
uh, UBM can also evaluate surgical outcomes. Here you can see a functioning lab with patent ostium and a very huge subconjunctival space, and a non-functioning lab would show perhaps a blocked ostium and a, an absence of a subconjunctival space. Uh, this is another to show uh, some more usage of uh, ultra ultrasound by microscopy. This is a, a key series by Kidi and his her team. So uh, the first one is showing a keratoprosthetic case. Uh, it used alpha core. It's an artificial cornea, and with that uh, artificial cornea, it's uh, it's making a direct visual visual visualization of the tube that was uh, previously positioned. Uh, was uh, difficult. And in this case, there's also a membrane uh, formation behind the keratoprosthetic. So, but with the UBM, we can nicely see how the tube is located. And actually in this uh, image, you can see the lumen is open. Um, so it should be functioning, but because of the, um, uh, we can, the, the examiner couldn't see it in the slit lamp because of the prosthesis and because of the membrane formation. And the second picture is actually uh, nicely showing a, a tube position in the posterior chamber. It sits nicely in the ciliary sulcus. And the lumen here is also uh, open. So it's uh, there's a patency of the tube opening. So it's, but in the clinical setting, the, the person uh, examining this tube may not see the tube because you can see it hides behind the iris. So um, in order to see the tube, you may, use UBM and it can show you nicely where it sits. So this is my last slide. Uh, just to uh, show you that ASOCT and UBM have comparable biometric parameters when used to assess the anterior chamber and angle. But uh, compared to UBM, ASOCT have some advantages, including a better uh, resolution, faster performance, there's not, uh, not a contact needed, less skill required, and it, because of its non-contact nature, it is useful in immediate post-operative period or for trauma cases. The disadvantage is, of course, is the inability to image structures posterior to the iris, and there's manual localization of scleral spur. And um, well, in the older days, the interpretation of specific to area scan is a problem, but then with the availability of SSOCT, this is no longer an issue, um, and both are costly. So. Uh, I think that would be all. Uh, I hope we can discuss uh, furthermore. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Astriandia, for your presentation. So before we proceed to our next speaker, I want to remind to all participants to type uh, your questions at the chat box. And we will have uh, the pause test at the end of this session. So stay uh, with us. So now we proceed to our next speaker, Professor Pao Chu from Singapore. Good morning, Professor Pao Chu. We are very honored to have you as one of the speakers today. Allow me to read your CV first. So Professor Pao Chu is Associate Professor and Senior Consultant of National University Hospital. He is the Director of Glaucoma Division, Department of Ophthalmology, National University Hospital, and National University of Singapore. He is Chief Examiner for Masters of Medicine of Hello. Uh, I have lost sound suddenly halfway through. Uh, can you hear me? I cannot hear you anymore. For some reason, uh, I can't hear you now. I was hearing you through my introduction. And then everything and the sound stopped. No, I'm sorry, I can't hear anything suddenly. If you can hear me, can you just tell me you can hear me by, by waving at me? Ah, yes. Good. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll speak. I'm sorry that I can't hear you anymore. I don't know why. I was hearing you until just halfway through the introduction and then everything stopped. Okay. Anyway, I'll just go on and give my presentation uh, in the absence of uh, uh, any further uh, 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 difficulties. You know, I, I'm going to have to ask you to, to, 
wait, something is wrong with my, because, you know, I, this happens as usual, just as I'm going to speak. So uh, please bear with me, and uh, I'm afraid we have some technical problems here. Can you call you, please? I need him to help me again. I can't find my presentation uh, here. Um, everything's uh, as usual. Everything stops just before I'm going to start. So sorry. Okay, um, give me a minute. It's okay, Prof. Take your time. We can wait. Okay, Professor Pochu, we can see your slide. So you can... I can hear you as well. I can hear you again. So I guess we can start now. So sorry about that. Okay. Uh, you can see my slides, huh? Um, okay. Um, shall we start? <laughs> All right. Um, so this is uh, just a disclosure. Uh, I'm going to talk about Microprose tree, and uh, here we have a um, my slides showing that I have affiliation in the sense that I'm the inventor and patent holder for the Micropulse tree device. So my apologies for that. Um, and also the, uh, I'm also an inventor. Excuse me, sorry, Professor Pochuk, could yes? you, you please uh, play your slide? Ah, you cannot see my slides now? Full screen? Um, full screen. Slide show. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not sure how to get my, my thing on full screen. Give me a minute. It, it was full screen just now, but uh, I don't know why I can't get it now. Mm, one more moment, please. Okay, uh, can you can I... go back to your PowerPoint. Uh, and yeah. then press your mm, slideshow yeah. F5. F5. You can try. Um, how's that? Any luck? Yeah. Five. Any luck? Or at the uh, right corner at the bottom of your PowerPoint. There is um, options for the slideshow. Okay, uh, let me try again. Huh? Let me start, let me start again. Yeah. Let's start again, they want the wonderful screen. So we need to get full screen. Yes, we can see your slide now, Professor. Okay, thank you. You can start your presentation. Okay, great. Thank you. I shall start now. So sorry for the delay. Um, thanks for my help here. <laughs> okay, right. So, so again, I just was mentioning we have some uh, uh, some some fine disclosures I have to make. Okay, now um, in terms of the. Uh, um, Why it's not moving forward? Okay, let's try this. Sorry, I can't get the I can't get the slides to go forward. Okay, here we are. Okay, it's it's working now. Okay, we're going to have an overview of patients and look at the patient selection. Talk about um, some of the pre and post op aspects and retreatments and some new some new ideas we have. So let's go into the first one. Just the first and most important thing to tell everyone is that uh, the, if this is a pass planar laser, it's not a pass, pass plicata laser. Now, I think this is something that everyone has to, to, to please remember because very often the confusion is because 
people think that this is similar to the G probe where we are lasering the ciliary body, but we're not doing that. We're lasering the past planar. So we're not damaging the aqueous production of the ciliary body in any way whatsoever. We are just increasing what I think is the uvoscleral outflow. Now, the uvoscleral outflow probably is because of increasing leak due to the specific disruption of the pigment epithelium over the past planar. There are alternative theories like ciliary muscle contraction by Johnston, but that was done in cadaveric models. And we have not been able to show this in human UBM post laser trials. Now here's version one, version two, version three. The, the third version, version three is what you can currently see today, but there's a new version four that will be see coming out soon. It's already been used in the US and uh, we should be seeing that coming into routine use sometime, hopefully in the next year. Now, when you're looking at lasers for, for this therapy, of course, consider things like who are we going to treat, adults or kids, and what, how, what, whether they have a lot of pigment or very little pigment, therefore race, and other issues, uh, for instance, what type of disease the glaucoma has. Now, they have, uh, of course, issues here of using it. Now, initially, when we did it, we, were, we, we did it for refractory severe disease. But, you know, nowadays, we find that Increasingly, it's also being used in open and angle closure. And also when we patients who can't use medicines, uh, unfit for surgery, or need additional lowering as an augmentation to their medicines or to prior to their surgery. So, you know, they're not fit for surgery, we do a bit of laser, then when they're fit, we do their surgery. Or, you know, let's say they need a, a, a tube implant because of rubiosis, but the pressures are really, really high. We don't want to open a 50 millimeter eye despite max, max medicine. And then we do a bit of laser first, bring it down to about maybe 30, wait a week or two to let the eye settle down and then we do the tube and it's a very elegant and quiet operation. Now, I'd just like to point out to you our outcomes here. If you look at the bottom table over here, you can see that the bottom two lines really talk about refractory patients. These are severe, severe disease. We had about 30 to 40 percent um, pressure lowering on average and decrease on medicines from, you know, from two to one approximately. More recently, we looked at uh, primary open angle glaucoma, and if you can see, that's a 30% reduction. And the objective here was not to reduce medicine, it was to prevent the patient going on for uh, incisional surgery. So therefore the number of medicines didn't change, but the pressure went down, so they didn't have to go for surgery or they didn't have to add on more medicine. So you know, that, that, that it's depending on how you're gonna use it, you can, you can use a strategy. Now, interestingly enough, when we first uh, described this, of course, we gave the patients peribulbar injections. We didn't really give retrobulbar, but we gave peribulbar with some sedation. But of late, for healthy patients, we're doing them topically in the clinic. So yes, we are able to, in healthy patients who are not too squeamish, uh, do topicals uh, of uh, micropulse tree. And this is something that we've been doing for the past year and a half now. And uh, you know, we can't do everyone. You have to choose your patients. Some patients are just not suitable, like very inflamed eyes or very, uh, very hot and tender eyes, you can't, you can't topical them. But if you're doing a standard primary open angle, angle closure type patient, uh, topical is a possibility, especially if the patient has no other medical illnesses. Now, just to bear in mind, we use uh, two watts of power and we use 50 seconds per, per hemisphere, so 100 seconds total with a duty cycle of one third. Uh, now, just, bear, just to mention that, you know, if you read a lot of papers from the US, they, they raised the, the duration from 100 seconds to 150 seconds, 180 seconds. Um, now, with the latest probe, they are suggesting it back down to 100 seconds, our original settings, and maybe power between 2 watts to 2.5 watts. Now, that's still uncertain, and I, and I, I would be cautious. I'd start at 2 watts rather than 2.5, but <clears throat> I suppose with different... Uh, populations and different races, you may have uh, to consider which one, which power you will use. I use two watts routinely. Now let's put a little video up now of uh, us uh, having a little, uh, having a surgery done. Not wondering, again, wondering why my video is not going. Oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah, here's, so, so notice we keep the probe a little further away from the eye. Don't let the, 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 the probe, you know, go over the limbus. Keep the probe on the eye continuously, and as you move across the eye, try not to, you know, drift further forwards because then you'll be treating the past uh, placata rather than the past planar. We want to stay back so that the laser fiber optic comes out over the past planar. Now there's a liquid interface here. 
the liquid interface allows you to make sure that all the laser gets into the eye rather than stop the conch. The probe has the round end facing the limbus, not the flat side, otherwise you'll be treating the pass planar. And keep the probe one meter, one millimeter, two millimeters from the limbus. The, the probe should be always aiming at the, at the center of the, of the globe, please. Do not uh, tip the probe. And use pressure just enough to be like writing a pen on paper. It's not, you're not trying to push a scalpel, a blunt scalpel through the eye. It's just you know, a gentle pressure just to have good contact, but don't indent the eye. Um, please treat uh, the hemisphere at a time. But if you feel your wrist is not feeling very comfortable and you can't uh, do the entire thing, then you can do one quadrant at a time. In total, when we do the uh, treatment, we try to go back and forth about four to five times. So over the 50 second treatment, go back and forth about four to five times. This is important for dosology reasons. If you go back and forth seven or eight times or two or three times, it'll be the wrong dosology and you won't be getting consistent results. So try and remember that you should be going back and forth about four to five times. Uh, two watts power is what I use, so that's what I recommend. And, um, and about, I would say 50 seconds per hemisphere and Iridex is also now saying 50 seconds per hemisphere, no longer 80. So this recommended, the duration is now decreased, especially with the new P4 Pro, right? Uh, please give a bit of steroids post up. I give a lot of prednol three times a day for a week. Um, some energy sick if you pay, think the patient needs it. Then this is important. Continue the glaucoma eye drops. Don't stop them immediately. Continue them and review the patient in a week or two and then consider whether you want to cut down drops slowly one by one. Many, many doctors have told me that they're, you know, the pressure didn't come down, but the patient was on four drops and diamox. You do the laser and then they stopped everything. And of course, naturally, the pressure didn't seem to come down very much because this is not meant to replace four drops and diamox. It's meant to augment them. And do review the, your patient's post-op to see whether the laser effect is continuous. And where you have patients with mild disease, POAG or quiet, Control disease, the effect should be continuous. But in patients which have neovascular glaucoma or other inflammatory glaucomas, we may indeed see a loss of effect. And here are three studies showing uh, that um, you know we have to deal also with severe disease. So can we stretch the micropulse to work a little bit better? Because twenty percent don't respond very well sometimes, um, and some of them they wear off. The treatment wears off uh, after one or two treatments. So can we look for a better way of doing it? So just bear in mind, if you're active inflammatory disease like uveitic or neovascular glaucoma, the pressure control may only be transient. So let's talk about something that may help to improve our outcomes. Here's the modified micropulse transcleral psychotherapy technique. So what we call MP3+, plus. this was published earlier this year. And um, we are happy to note that we were able to, with this laser, have slightly better uh, reductions of pressures and medications, which was a little bit more consistently uh, uh, sustained compared to just micropulse tree alone. This is not for the average everyday patient. These are for severe patients with things like rubiosis or previously failed MP3. So we're trying to stretch the envelope here, and uh, there's some evidence to say that we can work. How do we do it? Well, the the first part is you do a conventional MP3, just like you normally would. So the usual two watts, uh, 100 seconds, one third duty cycle, just finish the MP3 like you normally would. The second part then is to switch to a micropulse mode where you have 1.6 watts, a duty cycle of 41%, and two seconds per spot. So these are no longer the, the painting procedure. This is now firing over the pass planer like you would with a G-Pro. And you do six to eight spots per half. The objective here is that if there are fibrotic membranes, and you know, the hypothesis is that if you have fibrotic membranes or inflammatory membranes, they are waterproofing your pass planar. You're trying to disrupt the innermost surface of the pass planar to allow the uvascular outflow to leak through the pass planar. So these additional shots help to increase the leakiness of the pass planar and, and facilitate the MP3 laser. Now, um, we can also use it with cataract surgery, uh, for instance. And uh, you know, for, uh, what we do is, let's say, let's say I'm saying a patient wants to have a cataract and the mild POAG, rather than giving them a mix, what we do is uh, we do a FACO with a 
microcarbs. And we can see here we're doing is the two watts and one third duty cycle and 50 seconds per hemisphere. And this eye has had a, um, as you can see, a, a laser on the lens already. We've done a flex already. And after doing the, the flex, we uh, femtosecond laser assisted uh, lens softening, we do the MP3, and then we go on to do the FACO. And that has worked very well for us with good IOP control post cataract surgery. And we can remove usually one or two drops after the cataract as well. So um, this is uh, one more use I just want to quickly share with you. Um, something a bit newer, as we know in animals, we used an animal study to look at the presence of iris. As you remember just now, uh, Dr. Astriander showed the ciliary body sometimes can close the angle and ciliary body related angle closure has got no real very effective treatment because iridoplasty treats the iris, but it doesn't get rid of the, 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 the problem from the ciliary body being positioned anteriorly. So if we use um, transclerial laser, we can open the angle. In case you have a pre and post to show that after transclerial laser, we were able to open the angle. Um, here's the ciliary body position. And as you can see, post laser, the ciliary uh, body, the ciliary process has moved posteriorly and you have reopened the ciliary sulcus after the laser as well as opening the angle here. So um, this seems to be a nice specific treatment for plateau iris and this is done with transcleral laser and, and uh, the probe is still in prototype stage. Though. So just to, uh, in short, the micropulse does lower pressure and you can use it from this whole range of mild to severe. However, you have to ask yourself what you're trying to achieve. Perhaps in the mild, you're, rep you're, you're replacing medicine. In the moderate, you can perhaps augment medicine. And in the severe, perhaps it's an adjunct so that you can combine it for a future uh, glaucoma surgery, but keep the patient safe until that surgery happens. Let's say the patient is waiting for that surgery. Yeah? And um, it is uh, safe and, and um, perhaps we can even use it for angle closure in future. Um, it needs to be used uh, carefully. Check your powers to see what suits your needs. And remember that good technique gives you a much better outcome uh, rather than a poor technique. Uh, here's the team from uh, University Hospital that I'm working with. Thank you so much for listening to me and I'll answer questions later. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Pochu, for your presentation. It was very enlightening and enriching our current knowledge about uh, micropulse because this is uh, one of the new procedure for glaucoma patients. So before I proceed, I want to remind uh, for all the participants in order to get the certificate, don't forget to fill in the post test, uh, which will be uh, shared by link in the chat box, either in YouTube or in Zoom. So please stay with us. So uh, I will proceed to our next speaker, Dr. Firna. So Dr. Dr. Firna Dwi Oktariana, Specialist Mata Consultant, uh, is a glaucoma consultant in Department of Ophthalmology, Cipto Maun Kusumo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. She is the head of glaucoma division, Cipto Maun Kusumo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. She is also head of ophthalmology residency program, Cipto Maun Kusumo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. She is head of Indonesian Glaucoma Society. She is glaucoma, she had glaucoma fellowship program in Royal Perth Hospital and Lions Eye Institute. And she is the inventor of Firna Glaucoma Implant. So now please, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Firna, you can proceed for your presentation. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, uh, thank you for the committee to uh, inviting me to speak uh, re regarding this uh, topic about the considering surgery and open angle glaucoma. Uh, in this uh, topic, I will talk about 
uh, the background and introduction and uh, mostly may, may be related with the target pressure because we know in open angle glaucoma, uh, we care a lot about the target pressure so that the, uh, the disease will not progress. And then the, the third one, I will talk about the, a little bit about glaucoma surgery. Uh, and then uh, the most uh, common glaucoma surgery that we have done here. And then the last one would be uh, the, conclu the conclusions. As we know that uh, glaucoma is a chronic progressive optic neuropathy, and we could, know, we could see that a patient came to our clinic with several kinds of conditions. Uh, as we could see in, the, in this graphic, that a patient came with a, uh, with a this is the normal eye. The A is a normal eye with aging. We know that aging people also have a decreasing uh, visual function. And then the B is a glaucoma patient that came to our clinic with a, in older age with moderate progression. But if we compare with the C, the glaucoma patient with a younger age, although he had a moderate, uh, moderate progression as well as B, but C has a higher risk of visual function impairment compared to B because of coming in the younger age. And then the, we could see the patient with D condition, it is a patient with a very slow rate of progression. In this condition, we could maintain the treatment. And then the E is the patient with a very rapid progression. So we should do an aggressive treatment in this case. So, um, this, uh, this, this kinds are type of patient that come to our clinic. The goals of the treatment for glaucoma is uh, to, there are several uh, kind of, uh, we have to maintain the quality of life, quality of vision, and also we should uh, care about the cost. So it means that we have to maintain the patient's quality of life and visual function at a sustainable cost. At the time being, the most modifiable factors that related with the pathogenesis is uh, intraocular pressure. So in this topic, I will uh, talk more about the target pressure. In the condition of patient, uh, we could see in the Asia Pacific uh, glaucoma guidelines, there are several type of condition with a patient with a glaucoma with high, five higher risk uh, risk of progressive uh, visual loss. Uh, the condition mostly patient with a moderate to advanced glaucomatous optic neuropathy with correlating visual field, field loss. And then we could see in this patient, there is a demonstrated progression over a short of time. So we could see that this patient, the progression is, uh, is uh, quite severe. Uh, we could see that this patient come with a very high IOP and sometimes patient with bilateral visual field loss uh, we could. Uh, we have to be very careful in patients with pigmentary and pseudoexfoliative glaucoma, because they have a higher risk, uh, high higher risk for progression. Very advanced visual field loss uh, with a fixation threat and also glaucoma-related visual disability. Uh, and the patient uh, came with a young age and uh, advanced disease. Patient with a secondary glaucoma and patient with angle closure glaucoma. In this kind of uh, patients, Asia Pacific guidelines uh, uh, suggest to have a more than 40% uh, reduction of IOP. In the other condition with a patient with glaucoma with moderate five years of visual loss or glaucoma suspect with high risk for visual loss, uh, the condition should be like a mild glaucomatous optic neuropathy with correlating early visual field loss or and higher IOP. So the condition of the glaucoma is only mild, but it has a higher IOP. And also patient with mild to moderate glaucoma, but uh, the IOP is low. It is uh, the patient with condition of moderate uh, progression. A patient with a primary angle closer with a high IOP and then peripheral anterior synechia in a patient uh, in younger age. This patient with moderate, uh, moderate risk of visual loss, uh, the Asia Pacific guidelines ask to have a more than 30% reduction of IOP. And the third condition is patient with a glaucoma suspect, but uh, at a moderate risk of, for visual loss. Uh, in this case, usually we found patient the other eye, the fellow eye, 
there is established glaucomatous optic neuropathy, uh, but this patient actually uh, not the secondary glaucoma, but this is the primary glaucoma. And the patient with optic uh, um, ocular hypertension with multiple risk factors like thin, uh, thin uh, corneal thickness and then high IOP or suspicious disc. So we have to be very careful in this patient. Patient with a GLC gene mutations associated with zebra glaucoma. Recurrent, uh, patient that we found recurrent optic disc hemorrhage. Patient with a pseudo exfoliative syndrome. Uh, so it is not uh, glaucoma, but still in the syndrome. And the younger age. In this case, we have uh, the Asia Pacific guidelines suggest to have uh, more than 20% uh, of reduction. Uh, it is like a number for the target pressure, but in some guidelines, we could see that there is also like uh, individualized guidelines uh, for the, uh, uh, the patients. As you can see in this graphic, uh, the initial IOP for the patient uh, was uh, also, if we have the target pressure, we should see some of a uh, kind of condition, like uh, how is the functional loss of this patient. You could see this is the, in the, eh, sorry. Uh, like in, in this here, in this uh, total uh, functional loss in here, we could see there is from the normal physiological loss and then there is a continuing physical loss until it is there is a significant visual impairment. So we should, we should consider the functional loss. And then the rate of progression, this patient, we could see uh, how is the rate of uh, the progression of the patient. And then also several factors. This, uh, we, we will talk more in, in the next, in the next uh, slide. Uh, it's because the IOP is uh, quite uh, uh, factors for high, uh, I mean the risk factors for the uh, physical field progression. So there are study uh, by Aegis advanced glaucoma intervention study that long-term IOP variation is really correlated with the visual fluid progression. As we could see, if the IOP is more than 17.5 millimeter mercury, the visual fluid progression is higher. If the variation is less than uh, four, uh, 15 millimeter mercury. And then also the progression, if there is IOP fluctuation is if we could see there is the fluctuation more than three and uh, less than three. If the fluctuation in a patient is more than three, then the visual field loss is higher compared to the patient with uh, less uh, fluctuation. Like in this, this one is less than three millimeter mercury. Uh, this is one, the one that I want to talk about with the target pressure, uh, like uh, describing the, the graphic previously. So the condition we could see it is the glaucoma damage, the life expectancy, the untreated IOP, additional risk factors, and also rate of progression. All of this will uh, uh, make the doctors decide whether we will have a higher target IOP or lower target IOP. But then we should also know the adverse consequences of intervention, whether it is medication or whether it is the surgi surgery. We should uh, know the consequences of the type of the treatment that we choose for our patients. Also the patient preferences we should uh, consider and then the systemic condition. Patient with uh, uh, vascular dysregulation will have more problems compared to the patient with good uh, vascular condition. Uh, this is like a treatment al algorithm. I think we, we know that for juvenile or open angle glaucoma, the first choice is, is medical therapy. But if with medical therapy, it is, uh, the, the target pressure is not achieved, then we should consider about the laser. And then if it is not uh, possible, then we could do the surgery. Or, or we could just slide go to the surgery if we know that the IOP is very high. So indication for glaucoma surgery is, uh, failed medical or uh, and or laser treatment, and we know the second one is anticipated failure of medical medical or laser treatment because we know it is very high IOP and we need a very low target pressure, so we should do the surgery. The health condition to unavoidable interventions, 
the patient preferences because maybe the patient could uh, could could not cooperate with the very like several uh, topical medication and then other form of therapy are inappropriate like uh, poor adherence to medical therapy or side effects or socioeconomic problems uh, and some suggest if the patient is very far from health services uh, and then he or she can't uh, get the medication easily. So probably the primary surgery is one of the choices in this case. I want to uh, show you the medical adherence uh, compared to surgery. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, if you could see that, uh, I want to show you the graphic. If the uh, mean deviation is minus five, so it's like in the mild uh, condition, Usually, uh, the medicine, medical and surgery is quite the same, uh, the gain of the visual field uh, condition. But if it is uh, the surgery uh, and the medicine compared in the moderate condition, actually the visual field improvement is better with surgery compared to the medication if it is in the moderate uh, stage of the disease. And Caprioli in 2016 have uh, uh, say that in the research that mean decay rate of the trabeculectomy group is better. So previous, the, uh, prior to the surgery, the decay is about 2.4%, uh, but then after the surgery, it is 0.6%. Uh, in the comparative group, the one that uh, used the medication actually the decay of the fusel fluid is quite the same. Uh, the first half is 1.4%, but the second half is 1.7%. There is a, some type of uh, glaucoma surgery. Maybe you all know that there is a filtering surgery, there is a minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, and there is a glaucoma drainage device. Mostly we have a trabeculectomy. So I mentioned a bit about trabeculectomy. We know that if we choose trabeculectomy, although the the this, uh, the the visual uh, the IOP or the target pressure will achieve uh, quite uh, fast, but then uh, you know that the success rate of trabeculectomy will decrease during time. So uh, in these cases, a patient with trabeculectomy as well, we have to follow up the patient, and there are uh, there are patients in needing maybe with a, a post-operative inter intervention like. Uh, subconjunctival injection uh, like 5-FU or MMC or black needling or maybe some with a suture manipulation like a releasable suture or, or maybe a laser suture lysis and so on. So we should, uh, if we want to increase the success rate of the trabeculectomy, there are several things that we should do. So in conclusion, uh, we know that the, for the target pressure is the modifiable factor to slow the progression. So uh, it should be it should, it should consider factors that related with the disease and the patient and then also uh, for considering glaucoma surgery we know that many factors related to determine the surgery especially in patient with moderate to severe in open angle glaucoma glaucoma surgery may be beneficial for long term success of glaucoma surgery uh, we know that it could be lower during the follow up and need another intervention thus follow up of the patients are mandatory Thank you very much uh, for all your attention. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fina, for your presentation. So we will proceed to discussion session. So the first question is for Dr. Astrienda. In the time domain OCT angle picture, how to assess the weight and availability of the angle? How to assess the weight and availability of the angle? Yes. White and availability. availability. Okay. So uh, just like uh, the landmark slide that uh, I showed earlier, uh, we first uh, try to find uh, that landmark of scleral spur. So in front of scleral spur is uh, 
trabecular meshwork. So that area we have to uh, pay attention to. So if that area is uh, uh, closed or I mean uh, there's an iris root uh, right in front of that area, that means the angle is closed. So we uh, first we need to find out whether the there's something in front of the trabecular meshwork. So if there's nothing, the, the iris root is far away from that area. So that uh, is what we call an open angle. So the, the, depending on how uh, wide it is open, then it, it is uh, most likely, uh, uh, I mean, apa namanya? Mm, so it's 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 more uh, okay, lebih aman, lebih jauh, lebih aman. Jadi lebih lebih, yeah. So it's safer. Uh, it's it's. Uh, more open, but the if there is uh, iris root nearby and it's not uh, actually touching, then it's still open but narrow. So I uh, I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Astienda. And the next question is for Professor Paul Chu. Where should we locate the micropulse TLT probe in children with glaucoma who has bufthalmos and limbal stretching? Thank you. Professor Paul Chu, can yeah, you hear um, me clear? Yeah, I, I yes. do. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think answer. for kids, once the anterior segment is distorted, you need to retro, you need to have illumination. So I, I, I suggest um, you have to find where the ciliary body is and go behind it. Um, Best to done with a fiber optic light probe, and you put it on the limbus of the eye, let the eye light up, see where the dark area is beyond the limb, behind the limbus, and go behind that. Just go just behind that. So don't don't rely on the landmarks because it's no longer accurate. But uh, use a um, uh, some form of you know fiber optic uh, eyeball illumination, and put that in contact with the limbus to see how the eye lights up. Of course, you have to darken the OT so that you can. Uh, see how the light is transilluminating through the sclera and treat behind the dark area, which is the pars uh, placata. You treat the pars planar behind it. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think that's clear. Thank you, Professor Pochu. So the next question is for Dr. Firna. In open angle glaucoma, which cannot be treated with medication only, when do we consider lesser trabeculoplasty instead of straight to surgery? Uh, actually, if the if we uh, think that the IOP is not very high, so and our target pressure is not that uh, low as well, we could consider it. Uh, as as we could see, there is like a forty percent, thirty percent, and twenty percent target. If we want to use as a, the percentage as target. If maybe our target may be only about like 20%, we could use the trabeculoplasty. As we know that uh, laser trabeculoplasty is not uh, as, uh, as, as good as, uh, as surgery. But so if it is like a decent uh, target pressure, we could use the trabeculoplasty instead of the uh, surgery. Uh, I hope it, uh, it answer your question. Thank you, Dr. Vina. I think it's clear. And so for the next question, for Dr. Astrianda, to evaluate the blip with imaging, is there any preference between anterior segment OCT or UBM? Which one is easier or better to perform the blip, the blip evaluation? Please, uh, Dr. Astrianda. Thank you, Dr. Diela. So uh, both uh modalities can actually image or can actually nicely uh, give a view of the blab and its morphology uh, uh, i think uh, uh in my personal opinion it's better to use the asoct because it has a, a better or higher resolution and uh so we can actually view uh, the structures and uh the blab walls and uh the features that are uh uh, can be uh, offered in the ASOCT imaging. But UBM can also uh, be done, but considering that it is a little bit uh, more, I mean, it's a contact uh, technique and then you need to have the patient positioned uh, lying down. So it's it's a little bit uh, more extra 
effort to do. So an ASOCT is quite simple and you can just, uh, as long as the patient can, can be positioned nicely and it, there may be some troubles on um, directing the scan. It, it has to uh, go specifically uh, according to where the blab is. So you have to uh, clinically uh, know where exactly is the blab and then you do the scan so that you can uh, acquire a, a good image. And then um, it should be uh, better because it has a better resolution. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. Janet. And maybe because it's because it is contact for the UBM, um, maybe it can distort the blip. Um, it it can, I think. Yeah, but but uh, not necessarily because we we need to uh, hold the probe perhaps not too rigorously, not uh, not to uh, press down the structures. So if we do it quite gently, I suppose distortion is uh, not not so common. I think. Okay, thank you, Dr. Asinidia, for the clear answer. So for the next question, it's for Professor Paul Chu. I read some literature that said to do sliding for this cyclophotocoagulation. Does it matter if we do lesser, just put the prop, then move aside? Or is it different between G-prop or micropulse treatment? Thank you, Professor Paul Chu. Okay, um, my first slide that I showed just now actually pointed out that this is not the G-probe, right? This is the treatment of, the G-probe treats the past placata. Micropulse tree, uh, MP3 probe is for the past planar. The G-probe is a heating therapy on a single side. The micropulse is really a non-thermal disruption of the pigmented epithelium of the past planar. So yeah, it's not the same and you have to slide over the past planar. If you stay still and treat it over the past planar, then you get a different dosology and you treat a different number of population of the cells. So you're gonna get a different result. We have done studies on single shot on the past planar many, many years ago. Uh, and the results were that the pressures go down and the pressure goes up again. So the results were not, you know, it doesn't sustain pressure lowering. Um, and that was actually published. Um, so I would suggest that, you know, the technique of sliding it, painting it over the eye, treats a very large population of the cells, which is what you want to get the increase in the uvascular outflow. Um, is, that, uh, you know, is that appropriate for the answer? Is that answering the question? Okay. Thank you, Professor Pochu. Uh, Dr. Fiona would like to ask questions regarding to uh, this. Uh, Professor Pochu, do you have uh, experience with the long term of the micropulse treatment, Prof? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. there were in the original study group um, a three year follow up. And what we could show was that the pressure lowering of about 25 to 30% was sustained over three years, and this was actually presented at some major meetings and posters. Um, but the point is that these that were sustained were the ones that were stable. So they were patients who had no longer um, inflammatory active disease, like rubiotics that had the rubiosis suppressed successfully, so burnt out, or POAGs that were, you know, not, not um, that were on treatment, but then could have their treatments uh, reduced um, so that group does very, very well. But if you're doing cases where there's very active and inflamed uh, eyes, like acute rubiosis um, or you know, progressive disease like chronic angle closure glaucoma with uh, progressively closing angles, then I think that group, because the disease is progressing and the, and the disease is worsening, you will not see uh, long-term pressure control because the primary disease itself is continuing to, to go on. So I think, as like I said, we have to choose our patients and treat them specifically for the condition that uh, we're treating, that, we, that they have. Okay, thank you, Professor Pochu, for the answer. Uh, so, so the next question is for Dr. Firna. Uh, what is the consideration for performing primary tube surgery in primary open angle glaucoma? Uh, 
uh, actually uh, I'm one of a more like a conservative uh, <laughs> for the surgery but I know that in some condition we have to do that uh, like a primary surgery uh, mostly if uh, we want to have uh, like a long-term uh, control of the IOP and then uh, usually related with the age of the patient if it is like a younger age uh, so early onset uh, open angle glaucoma like a more like juvenile glaucoma and with very high IOP so sometimes you have to put a primary tube in this uh, case but uh, mostly of uh, if it is the case with uh, primary open angle glaucoma I if I have to choose the surgery usually I've uh, I've done with a trabeculectomy colectomy first unless there is a, a, some kind of condition like that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Firna. So uh, for the next question is for Professor Pochu. Is it okay to perform micropulse on non-refractory glaucoma patients? Uh, maybe it means primary procedure. If so, which patients are the best candidate whom could benefit most from the procedure. Is there any contraindication to perform micropulse? Thank you. Okay, there's a few questions there. So yes, actually I, I showed um, the primary open angle glaucoma data in my talk just now showing that, you know, we do, we are able to achieve about a 30% lowering in a POAG group. And that's from a publication that's upcoming. Um, but of course the whole objective there was we were treating POAG to either uh, pre, you know, replace surgery uh, because you know, these are patients who maybe would need a trap or that may need another drop. So instead of adding on another drop, we, we used the micropulse. And, and that's why you notice the number of medicines remained the same before and after, but the pressures went down 30%. So yeah, we, it does work on the POAT group. However, it won't work on the normal tension group. So please don't uh, try to do it on, on normal tension patients because your scleral outflow has a has a you know a physiological bottom limit of around about maybe I don't know ten millimeters eight millimeters, so you know you, you're not really going to get a much hypotony or very low pressures with the micropulse. So micropulse is primarily for the raised pressure group of patients. So if you have POAG pressures twenty five on one medicine, ideal you, you instead of adding a second medicine you do a uh, you do a micropulse, and some patients may can may get off that single medicine even. Uh, and other patients will be controlled with one medicine. So um, that's the kind of group that I think works very well. Did I miss one more question? Was there one more question? Contraindications, yes. Uh, don't laser patients with, uh, you know, previous retinal, uh, uh, previous conjunctival scars, um, avoid old trap sites, don't laser over tube, uh, <laughs> you know, because you have a tube, the tube would, would make cause the conch to tear and, uh, if there's a lot of pigmentation like melanosis on the conjunctiva, maybe you should not put the laser on those eyes because the laser won't go through the, the melanin on the conjunctiva. So yes, there, were, there are those indic indications where the conjunctiva is not normal. You should really think carefully about uh, doing the laser. Okay. Thank you, Professor Bochu, for your explanation. So unfortunately, because the time is up, we are very sorry that not all the questions can be answered. Uh, so before I conclude uh, this session, Professor Porchu, would you like to add some comment? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's really uh, very, and, you know, very useful having this talk and I really enjoy um, joining everyone. Uh, it's been very inspiring and listening to the discussions from the other speakers as well. Um, makes me realize why you know I was so passionate about some of these uh, topics in the past. Continue to be very interested. I hope we can have more of these discussions. And if anyone has any further burning questions about Micropulse Three, uh, you know, feel free to contact me, and I'm very happy to reply to you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Professor. About you, maybe Dr. Astrendo, you would like to say something. I would just, uh, I would like to say uh, thank you, Prof, for your time and uh, the collaboration. We are very happy to have you here. And uh, yes, uh, I think uh, many of us still have questions, and we will uh, be in touch with you. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have reached to the end of this webinar session. 
thank you very much for all speakers, Professor Pao Chu, Dr. Asjenda, and Dr. Firna. Thank you for your willingness to share your time and expertise to all of us. So this is the end of today's scientific session. Thank you very much for all participants. Um, I really hope this webinar series um, reaches your knowledge and helps you better understand about topics we had earlier. So I conclude this meeting and I will give it back to Dr. Mita. Please, Dr. Mita. Thank you. Yang terhormat seluruh peserta webinar, demikian acara ilmu. NUH Collaborative Webinar Series pada hari ini. Terima kasih untuk semua partisipan yang telah berpartisipasi. Uh, thank you also very much for Prof. Clementan and Prof. Paul Chu for the very interesting lectures and discussion. Also, thank you for all attendees from National University Hospital. Terima kasih pula kepada PT Optik Tunggal yang telah mendukung lancarnya berjalannya hari ini, uh, acara hari ini. Semoga kegiatan hari ini bermanfaat bagi kita semua. Sekaligus kami ingin menyampaikan dan mengundang bahwa seri kedua dari webinar series ini akan diadakan di hari Minggu tanggal 12 Juli 2020 pada waktu yang sama yaitu pukul, mulai pukul 9 pagi dan e, peserta dapat meregistrasikan diri melalui tautan yang akan kami sebarkan melalui media sosial baik melalui grup chat maupun Instagram at RSCM Kirana. Terima kasih, selamat siang, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.